and uh, I am member of Platypus, and uh, I'll speak about Platypus when we start this thing, but uh, yeah, so I'm one of the people who has organized it, this to a formal I'm Vaughn Cartwright, um, I'm one of the organizers also, um, I'm a graduate student at Boston University. I'm Emmanuel Teyes. I'm one of the organizers uh, as well, part of the um, Harvard chapter of Platypus. I'm a worker. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, and a poet. Oh, I'm Shivani. I work for Brigham and Women's in Global Health Justice. And I'm my second time at Platypus. I'm Julian. I'm from Switzerland. I'm the first of second time there. I'm in the post work here in the economy. Uh, I'm Alex Gorovich. I'm a political theorist, uh, currently at the Brown Political Theory Project. Uh, I'm writing something for the Platypus Review. That's why I found out about the uh, My name is Brendan Cooney. I'm, uh, I'm not from anywhere. I just moved to this town. Good job. <laughs> um, I'm Rachel. Um, I am in sexual health and sexuality education at Planned Parenthood and at the Victim Rights Law Center. I'm Ignat. I'm a graduate, uh, undergraduate student at MIT. Um, I'm also um, half of the time at Harvard, and I'm balancing between physics and philosophy. Um, I'm Kaya. I'm an undergrad at UMass Boston studying psychology. Uh, I'm Bob Bowles. I do work with uh, Veterans for Peace and other uh, activist groups locally. And my name is John Vandenecker. I run a research institute. Uh, I do a consult I'm a president of a consulting company and I'm a Zen priest. I'm Laura. Um, I'm the Institute Director for Human Rights Platypus, um, and I'm also associated with the Harvard chapter, and I'm a graduate student at Harvard in the History of Science Department. Hi, I'm Mitch Hampton, and I'm, I'm completely new to Platypus. Um, I was inspired by the writings. I, I stumbled across uh, information on the web, and I was very inspired and, and respected the, the, um, the quality of the writing and, and theorizing. I thought it was a really good group, and that's why I started attending meetings. I'm, I'm a musician and writer, jazz pianist. I'm Jason Ginetti, and uh, I teach philosophy at Dean College in Franklin, Mass. And I also uh, have an immigration law firm in Brookline. And I am privileged to be Manuel's uh, friend, and he has been leading me down the path to Platypus. <laughs> My name is Evan Sanvieto. I'm a communist and member of the Freedom Road Socialist Organization. I've been working uh, with Occupy Boston since its beginning, and I'm also a founding member of the Occupy Boston Socialist Caucus. I also go to school at night uh, for my labor studies degree, which I'll finally be receiving in June. Uh, my name is Stephen Squibb. Uh, I'm, uh, I work with um, an exam and post-forming, also a little bit of monthly review, um, and uh, I'm a graduate student here. I'm Doug Ina Green. I'm a revolutionary communist and also a member of the Kasama Project. And I've been involved with Occupy Boston since its beginnings. I'm a member of the Socialist Caucus and the Howard Zinn Memorial Lecture Series as well. Okay, back at the room over here. Um, my name is Elizabeth. I'm a master's student at MIT in the Urban Planning Department. Um, I've never been to one of these events, but I'm on the MIT Occupy Boston this year. I've helped out with some of the design for winterization. So I'm just very to check it out. Uh, hi, I'm Maite Tapia. I'm a, a graduate student at Cornell University in um, International and Comparative Labor and Social Media and stuff. So I'm very interested to hear. Okay. I just apologize if I leave early. I have a three week old in it. Oh, okay. no, it reflects no way on um, what's going on. Um, one of uh, our speakers in court couldn't make it today at a somewhat last minute uh, sort of uh, decision. So we haven't been find replacement, so that's going to be something that we might, you know, miss in the, in the panel. But hopefully, you know, sort of all these questions will make up for some of that. Um, 
So I, I'll, I'll start now, I guess, and then we can, you know, people seem to be walking in in what we do these Okay, so, yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming here, and, you know, especially the speakers. Uh, so, Occupy Wall Street began on 17 September 2011 in Zuccotti Park. Wall Street protest against social and economic inequality, high unemployment, greed, corruption, undue influence of corporations and government. The movement has since dramatically spread across several cities, taking many different forms. And Occupy Boston, which you know, hopefully, sort of a lot of a lot of has been written about Occupy Wall Street. I think Boston is some interesting things that might come out today. Uh, which began on September 30th, 2011, quickly came to its own because one significant thing about Boston was the strong presence of students in the movement. Um, so Occupy Harvard is actually, you know, a significant example of this sort of student participation, which has led to this controversial closure of Harvard Yard. Um, and the Harvard, Occupy Harvard website notes that uh, in previous occupations, such as the living wage campaign in 2001 and the Vietnam War protests in 1969, Harvard did not respond by closing down the yard. This, that's what's happening now, is unprecedented. So what might this mean? So, you know, we can begin by thinking about this idea, what might this mean for possibilities for social change today, vis-a-vis -vis what happened in 1969 when they didn't close the yard, or in 2001. Uh, for many, the protests on Wall Street and elsewhere have provided an avenue to raise questions that the left has fallen silent on. Um, you know, we don't talk about those questions anymore. Some others are maintaining that these protests actually signify a new era of possibility for leftist politics. And yet, we only have to look back a few years to realize that Obama's presidential victory, which is a very hopeful move, moment for the left, around the world actually, actually put an end to the anti-war protest movement. So, you know, everyone just stopped protesting the war. Uh, in other words, possibilities for leftist politics have not always translated into advancements for the left. Platypus is interested in cultivating an active culture of thinking and debating within the left, a debate that is critical and yet not divisive. The present moment offers possibilities for the left, even if we might not fully know what those possibilities are. Platypus tasks itself with the responsibility of creating avenues for engagement and reflection on these possibilities, which is, you know, this is one such thing that we are trying. Um, while public debates on Occupy have been somewhat common in New York City, well, to an extent common in New York City, in Boston, such opportunities for public reflection and debate outside of the General Assembly model are somewhat difficult to find. And by this I mean that the opportunities to discuss the political stakes about the, in, within the Occupy movement are actually rare. And so that is what we are here to do today. Um, towards this goal, Platypus is hosting a series of roundtable discussions with organizers and participants in the Occupy movement. Uh, they started their campuses in New York and Chicago, Philadelphia and now in Boston. But We'll also be moving to other North American cities, to London, Germany, and Greece. These are places where Platypus has chapters uh, in different universities in, in these and some other cities as well. So we start with the question, what, what would it mean to challenge capitalism on a global scale? How do we begin to overcome social conditions that adversely affect every part of life? And how, do we, how could a new international movement address these concerns in practice? So we would like to welcome any and all who would like to be a part of this project of self-education and potentially rebuilding of the left to join us in advancing this critical moment. So I'll just give a quick background about Platypus. It was started in 2006 by a group of students who were discontented with the anti-war movement and quickly became an organization that put together public fora and publishes a monthly newspaper that just review. It's available in the back there for everyone. Um, over the last several years, Platypus has also panels on imperialism, on the 2000 presidential elections and the left, on Israel-Palestine and the left, sexual liberation, many, many, many others. And we publish articles from leftists around the world in an effort to host a conversation for the left. You might have seen us participating in some rallies and demonstrations, carrying a banner, let the left is dead, long live the left. So what does this mean, the left is dead, long live the left? The slogan is actually an attempt to capture the limits that we face in bringing about political transformation and also to reinforce our claim that it is only the left that can actually offer us a way forward to change society. So I'm going to wrap up very quickly by talking for a minute about what we do in Boston. We have two campuses uh, in Boston. One is at Harvard and one is at MassArt. 
So, you know, students who sort of uh, are around, especially Harvard, you know, if you go to MIT, uh, I would encourage you to sort of come. We have weekly reading group meetings where we discuss Marxism and the history of the left. We also have coffee breaks where we discuss politics. Uh, more information can be found on boston.cardis1917.org. You can also sign up on the sign-up sheet over there. Um, copies of newspaper are available. Okay, I'm done. So the speakers have already introduced themselves. I have a blurb about each of them, which is remarkably similar to what they say. So that's good. Um, I am going to uh, quickly explain the format. Uh, in the beginning, the, the panelists were presented with six questions that were meant to start the discussion. So what I'll do is I'm going to read the questions out one at a time, and we will invite speakers to sort of speak to them. Um, and then hopefully there will be plenty of time for Q and A and things like that. After that, so uh, we're trying to get an audio recording. There should be a video recording as well. You know, we can have those things uh, distributed afterwards. Um, okay, so I'll start with the questions. Um, in light of the recent series of coordinated and spectacular evictions that have been taking place since November 15, including violent action in campuses and elsewhere, is it fair to say that the Occupy movement has entered a sort of phase two? If so, what is the nature of this new phase of the movement's development? To expand, how has the occupation been forced to adapt to a changing set of conditions on the ground? What sort of fresh difficulties do these new conditions pose for the occupiers? A moment of crisis can also be a moment of opportunity. What direction do you feel the movement should take in order to remain viable and relevant? So you can speak right. Someone has some ideas. Start. I guess we can start with me and work our way down. Sure. Organization. Um, the evictions of different occupiers around the country, I think. Uh, and I hope will lead to a more decentralized form of protest because one of the things that has been wonderful and to some frustrating about the Occupy movement is that it is decentralized. Um, people always speak about grassroots movements but they don't know what to do with them uh, when they pop up and the press, the media, uh, critics from uh, across the political spectrum have criticized the Occupy movement for not having a platform, not having a, uh, a leader, not having uh, an organization that gets out the message in a clear fashion. Um, but I think all of that is indicative of the populist uh, upsurge that caused the movement and the fact that it spread from Manhattan throughout the country, it's led to a, in, a, in an uncoordinated way, or at least seeming so, uh, it's led to a decentralized form of protest. And I think that um, in the 21st century, with the media that we have, and the forms of communication that we have, to try to squash one uh, very visible area of protest is only going to lead to uh, more protests in different areas. Already around Boston, you've probably seen them. There are posters up for Occupy Alston, Occupy Brighton, and I think that if um, the, the central area of Dewey Square is not a place that people can voice their their grievances, then they'll see it happening in other places, and that decentralization can be a strength for the Occupy movement because it can get more people involved in more different places um, and become more visible. And at the same time, it may diffuse whatever message, uh, centralized message, people are trying to get out, but I don't necessarily think we need to take that as a bad thing. So. The Occupy Movement is in its second organizational phase. On December 10th, Mayor Menino ordered the BPD to clear out the camp. I can literally imagine him stuttering like he usually does and signing his name allegedly to a police order. Everyone underestimated the importance of the camp. In the age of the spectacle, the age where commodity has become image, Dewey Square was the only place where alienation was temporarily disbanded. 
Decisions were made in common space and then acted upon by the same individuals. If anyone was looking for becoming politically engaged, Dewey Square was their first answer. Without a corresponding physical space, even in office, the importance of this importance of revitalizing the plazas, or the concept of the plazas, which was also crucially important for the Bolivian people in organizing their movement against dispossession, um, there needs to be a transformation in the direction that Occupy takes. Occupy began as a movement, but I've always wanted it to transform itself into an organization capable of maintaining simultaneous demands and campaigns. In this way, we do need a National Occupy Congress of Delegates or spokespeople in order to complete this transition. Occupy needs to become the new organizational form of value producers, uh, whether an immaterial work like service work or excluded forces like contingent part-time work and unemployed people. There have been some proposals, uh, like get an office, use a union hall, use a church, so on and so on. There have been plenty of moralistic responses, like we can't take any money, we can't use money, we need to make sure everything is free. But no, let's be realist right now. We do need an office. We have enough money to sustain a small office anywhere in Boston and become an organizational structure and popular discipline. Secondly, what I find crucially important is the move in New York City towards occupying foreclosed homes, serving the people, and occupying abandoned buildings. These actions are situated at some of the most explosive contradictions of potential. Capitalism is literally expropriated from people, primarily people of color, and occupies insistence on stretching the limits of what is considered possible, allows the possibility of the lowest and deepest sectors of the working class to take command and light the sky. So Occupy not only needs to become an organization, but also situate itself more thoroughly on the contradictions it already exposes by reclaiming property, building collective spaces, and serving the people. <coughs> Um, well, I think uh, I'll, I'm going to respond sort of in two ways. First, I'm going to talk slightly more abstractly about why I think this question is so vexing, um, or has been so somewhat vexing, and then to specifically what at least Occupy Boston um, and Occupy Harvard are, are doing. Um, so I think the tricky thing about um, the occupations is that I think it's first of all that we should pay attention to the name, which is sort of strange to be like calling the civil rights movement the, the you know, uh, sit-in movement or the sort of boycott movement. You know, occupation is a tactic. Um, it's not a new one, uh, although the form that we've seen uh, with this sort of latest eruption is slightly different than uh, has been historically practiced. But I think it's it's important to recognize what sort of is already delimited and what is sort of already cut off when we think of it as an occupy movement, right? sort of the occupation phase of a larger movement for economic justice. Um, because I think what was happening in the occupations uh, was really two sort of um, instincts that were sometimes pulling in the same direction, but sometimes pulling in different ones. Um, certainly at the level of the sort of commune of the thing, you had um, a sort of performance of an autonomous uh, collective. Now, it wasn't actually autonomous, of course, because it depended on uh, donations and other sorts of resources pouring in constantly, but there was an attempt to sort of perform a different kind of organization where one, you know, really could volunteer in the food den in the morning and, you know, lead a march in the afternoon and criticize after dinner. Um, however, that was a sort of base camp for um, a sort of more traditional set of nonviolent direct actions that have a long history, certainly in America and around the world. Um, what was different, though, or somewhat different this time, was that historically in America, uh, certainly again in the civil rights movement, nonviolent direct action has always been an effort to begin negotiation or to begin the satisfaction of very specific demands, which um, the occupations were by and large not interested in issuing. Um, which, again, would be one thing if there was a sort of pure autonomous community that was trying to be formed. But as this sort of half-protest community, half-autonomous thing, oftentimes I think you saw these things tripping each other up, right? So you had neither the discipline of a student nonviolent coordinating committee, nor the truly autonomous structure of, like, you know, your commune in the woods or whatever, but you sort of had sort of aspects of both. Um, and so I think the question of where the occupations go from here and that they have been evicted is always tripping up over the sort of dual character of it, right? Does it want to go and be something more like a disciplined um, activist, nonviolent direct action sort of thing, or does it want to go in the other direction and sort of continue working on these sort of communes and maybe try to reset up one up that is slightly more uh, effectively uh, autonomous? Um, so I think those are the things that are sort of haunting this, this, this conversation. Uh, in terms of what's happening in Occupy Boston, um, we actually, we do have an office um, at um, Euro Centro 5, which is a big sort of union building in Chinatown. Uh, and we are working with several local groups, including City Life Vita Urbana, which is, um, does occupation blockades for folks who are getting evicted in Dorchester and um, Roxbury. 
the tricky thing there is, of course, that these two communities, it's one thing to bring you know, 500 cops to Dewey Square, it's another thing to bring 500 cops to Dorchester. Um, and so I think the issues that we're sort of sorting through is, is to what extent these home occupations or these occupations of um, buildings can function on the same sort of model. Um, and in some sense, it's a false conversation because, of course, the occupations were spontaneous. To a large extent, they were sort of self-organizing. Um, and so the minute you go back and sort of take an existing group and try to reorganize something again, the, the whole context is, is shifted. Um, but I think the question of what, uh, what of those structures to bring into these uh, other communities and other forms of organization, which are more top-down, which are more traditionally activist in that respect, um, is going to be an interesting question. Um, I think uh, that seems to be the sort of energy I'm encountering across the occupation movement and move towards in working with other existing groups. I have not seen or heard truly any sort of attempt to work on the other aspect of it, which is to go back and find a new way of, of doing this common thing. Um, which is odd because so much of the intellectual discourse is dominated by this sort of communization topic, um, which comes out of a very specific um, stream of vanity and engineering. But um, so I think that's what's interesting is that as people talk about communization, they're actually working on direct action in a sort of traditional um, environment. Well, I think also that we have definitely entered a, a phase two, as Evan pointed out. Occupy Boston, at least the physical space at Dewey Square is uh, no longer there. In fact, but the Boston police have effectively salted the earth by replanting it, or the Rose Kennedy Greenway. It's almost like Rome did to Carthage after she destroyed it. But before this occurred, Occupy Boston was attempting to figure out what its next phase was. There was a whole winterization committee to figure out how we're going to survive the winter. We're going to get army tents, indoor spaces. And now that dynamic has uh, changed dramatically, one of the slogans that all tendencies of the, the movement have adopted, except right before the eviction and now after it, is you can't evict an idea. And it's a very catchy slogan, but what does it mean? What does the idea of Occupy mean now that the camp is gone? Occupy opened up the debate on taboo topics that are ignored in the current so-called discourse in the media. These toxic topics range from income inequality to racism to capitalism to empowering the 99% or empowering the working class. Now that the camp is gone, we have to find a way to reach past the immediacy of what, of what was the camp site at Dewey Square. To give an example, before the eviction, if people wanted to find out about Occupy Boston, all they had to do was take the subway down to Dewey, then get out, walk around, and ask questions of those at Occupy. It was very convenient. And it was a, a very interesting way to counter a lot of the, the discourse that was coming out of the, the press. But this means, but now that that is gone, this means developing ways to reach the other members of the 99% who do not know much about the movement. Again, we sort of suffered a um, press blockade, or a, if you want to get slightly cynical, the press have been giving misinformation. This means more outreach to labor. African Americans, Latinos, and other press groups, in a sense, hitting those fissures of the system, those contradictions of the system in this moment of crisis. And this means developing those new modes of communication through the internet, radio, social media, newspapers, and local television. And some of this has already begun. And part of this, this problem of using this equipment of this outreach is kind of logistical. Finding the equipment and resources to do this is Part. And it means relying on the goodwill of those in the struggle and trying to raise the money to provide for it. Because we still live in a commodity-based society and, unfortunately, money is still a medium of exchange. And this is always a struggle for any movement that does not rely on the powers that be. And this is a challenge, but then again, revolutions are not for the timid. We all have a sharp learning curve. Those at Occupy have learned a great deal. The struggle changes you very much. Two or three months ago, people who didn't know how to put together a newspaper have been learning. People who didn't know how to organize a meeting have learned. And it is and part of this learning process, this learning curve, and the, the idea of the struggle changing you is that how do you make a newspaper that reflects the 99% a movement of emancipation and liberation? And is not a mere reflection of the world that we're rejecting. A major part of the challenge thus lies in thinking about the world we want to see and how to bring it to realization. So very much a, a connection between the means and the end.
Occupy Boston, for instance, passed a declaration of occupation on November 30th, which stated, our goal is a society that prioritizes the needs of all before the profits of the few. That means that if we are serious about bringing this new society into being, we will have to shape our outreach and activities according to, accordingly to help the masses of the 99% liberate themselves and build a world without the 1%. This, that means breaking with old ideas and learning afresh. And this process is certainly going to be difficult. It is, and it's fraught with many contradictions. Real change is not a simple march forward. It's very much zigzag. It comes through struggle with not merely opposing forces of the state and capitalism, but the ideas of the old world that we have to overcome. And anyone who had been at Dewey Square can very much see that those ideas were very much there. In order to move forward, though, it means that Occupy has to be serious about building a new world and crafting that message accordingly. We need to be ready to learn and to teach, to suspend the existing ideological parameters and thinking new, and ultimately building red political power, which I'll get to later. Okay, but the, um, I'm, I'm moving on to the next question, but I just wanted to sort of, you know, um, arrive at it, I suppose. That, that the, 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 the thing that sort of seems to be the most difficult thing about Occupy really is this learning curve that you that you mentioned, but also I think everyone was in different ways really talking about the challenges of like late and late challenges that you face, just sort of being there out in the cold and you know. Um, we one of our potential speakers like dropped out a few weeks ago because uh, <coughs> he was sick from staying out in the night. You know, so so of course there are these things which which are which are so real. The, the other question, however, is sort of like, it seems to me that it's a little difficult to, uh, to think about ideas, sort of political ideas, of what, what does it mean? What does it mean to sort of, you know, um, what does it mean to have a new society? Or, or, or rather, like, the, the demand for a new society. Or, okay, let's think about it different. The demand for a new society is not a new one. Like, sort of like, we've been asking for new societies for, you know, the last hundred or so years in different ways. It, you know, sort of the various parts of the left have been trying to articulate this demand. So um, one sort of similarity that I'm sort of coming to the question now, one similarity that the Occupy movement shares with our somewhat immediate past is actually the anti wto protests in Seattle um, in 1999. Both began in the last year of a democratic president, sort of presidential rule, uh, they were spearheaded by anarchists, they were motivated by discontent with neoliberalism, uh, both also saw support, sense of support actually, from organized labor. Um, they were both celebrated for being leaderless and horizontal by, you know, Harden Negri and sort of John Holloway, the same people we also see sort of re-emerging again, talking about Occupy using very much the same language as well. So. What is it that is making this movement different in a certain sense? I mean, I, I, I don't mean this in terms of its strategies because yes, there was no occupation in Seattle in the same sense as it is now, but how is this a departure from Seattle? What, what, what do we sort of uh, learn from the defeat of Seattle as well? You want to do the same order? Sure. Sure. <clears throat> well, I ask you, what did the protests of the WTO in 1999 really accomplish? I don't think they really accomplished much. And that leads me to make a very clear distinction between those protests and what's happening today with Occupy Movement. The biggest difference that I see between the two is the zeitgeist of what is happening now. In 1999, we were at the, we in America were at the top of one of the biggest economic bubbles in history. And uh, there were more people invested in the stock market in America than uh, had ever been percentage wise since 1929 before the market crashed. Um, people were invested in the entire system in 1999 large swaths of people were invested in it. And uh, having protests of the WTO uh, was, you know, a, a voice in the wilderness that was not heeded at all. Maybe people should have heeded those voices, but they didn't. What we see now is 
unemployment in the United States that is at levels that it has not been since the Great Depression. And though the numbers are going up and down, uh, I think with the storm clouds that are coming over from Europe, uh, people are deluding themselves if they think that this was a one-time recession and that it's going to get better. Um, we're seeing in Spain 20% unemployment. We're seeing incredible unemployment and, uh, and discomfort, to say the least, in Greece and uh, in Italy. I think that there is a sobriety taking place across the industrialized world that, uh, that allows people to hear the message of Occupy and to uh, feel a camaraderie with the injustices that Occupy is trying to uh, point out and to uh, overthrow. So I think that at this time, with economic conditions um, affecting everybody, and I believe poised to affect a lot more, uh, I think that uh, the message is going to be heeded uh, by many more. Um, but I don't know that the numbers are going to be large enough to, or, or the means or the tactics or anything is going to be powerful enough in the near future to uh, have an effect that can counteract the, uh, the powers of the economic uh, forces and juggernauts that are poised against them. Um, <clears throat> I think that with people invested in 401ks, people invested in the stock market, of still a vast majority are, and uh, it's going to take a lot more pain and suffering among the middle class uh, before we see any real change taking place, either politically or in the street. So uh, I think that 1999 was an interesting uh, time because we stood at the precipice of the beginning of the end of that economic bubble, but people were not ready to hear that message then. Now they might be more ready to, to hear. Um, I'm not as familiar with the anti-globalization movement as some of our panelists probably are, but I'm going to make a few comments based on It uh, doesn't particularly bother me that the Occupy movement or the movement against the WTO was spearheaded by anarchists. However, this is an assumption that we probably should challenge. Occupy certainly uses anarchist methods. It certainly draws an inspiration from the Invisible Committee who argues for building communes everywhere and engaging in a network model of insurrection. However, while the form is in fact anarchist, the majority of forces that initially participated in Occupy were formerly middle class forces with a strong liberal or social democratic outlook. But in terms of differences with the anti-WTO pro uh, protests, here are a few of them that I, that I see. Uh, first, Occupies are situated locally. But you and the communist hypothesis was sort of perplexed as to why politics were engaged in actions at the center of power, which is basically illusory. Taking the streets to the WTO and IMF events are admirable, but the occupations work locally in a wide variety of social formations. They literally encompass every state, often different cities and towns within each state. I see the Occupy movement as encompassing a wider range of problems than the WTO movement or the movement against the WTO, which is focused on fair trade outsourcing, so on and so on, the anti-democratic nature of those organizations. While there are libertarian forces taking part, the Occupy movement has not been strongly nationalist. Here in Boston, we passed a declaration of occupation which has a strong internationalist outlook. For example, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the occupation renamed itself unoccupied as an acknowledgement that New Mexico is indigenous land colonized by Europeans. I think that these primary differences make Occupy a broader and deeper movement than the anti-globalization movement generally. <coughs> yeah, um, I was actually going to say the same thing about the return of the local. So that's absolutely right. Um, of course, the genius of an occupation is that it is local precisely as it participates in a sort of global project. Um, I think, just to add to that, a couple other things. Um, I actually think the Occupy movement is more focused than um, the anti-WTO stuff. Um, you know, I, everyone's always like, oh, what, is it, what are the demands that they want? The initial, the inciting incident was called Occupy Wall Street. Um, and 
and so I really feel like there's kind of a willful blindness for anyone who doesn't know what that means. Um, it's very much focused on or incited by, uh, you know, misbehavior slash systematic corruption slash the truth of the capitalist system as it manifests itself um, in the financial industry. And I think that the WTO protests were actually a much more sort of diverse um, and diffuse set of issues. Um, certainly, Seattle was um, the first sort of American eruption of what had been, um, you know, as you know, Hobsbawm said that everything was global except for politics, right? And so I think that in the Seattle moment was the first time America had an image of what that actual global politics was beginning or trying to look like. But it's important to recognize that I think it had been going on for quite some time. Um, in my own estimation, I think really the lineage of the Occupy movement goes, you know, back through uh, the fall of the Soviet states to solidarity in Poland, to the autonomy in Italy, to the May 68 in Paris, to Hungary in 56. Um, I think that's really the sort of arc that ends in Occupy, um, and we can talk more about why that is. But um, so I think that Seattle was another sort of eruption of that of that similar sort of trend, but I actually think it was less. Um, it was focused on globalization, but. Um, in, in such a variety of different ways that I think um, it, it was actually sort of even less clear what was going on uh, than the occupations. Um, I don't particularly think Seattle was a failure. Um, I don't really know what it would have been for it to be a success. I think it, um, I think it did what it, what it, could, what it last, the most it could possibly hope for uh, to accomplish in that moment. Um, but yeah, that's those distinctions, I'll say. Okay, well, during the Seattle protests and the anti-globalization movement in general, there's a strong feeling against the undemocratic financial institutions such as the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, and others. These organs were seen as enforcing free trade on the planet that was detrimental to workers and oppressed peoples and only benefited the capitalist class or under the movement's parlance now, the 1%. And they were, of course, right about this. And to go further, I believe the uh, Seattle protests actually accomplished a great deal for myself, I was still in high school, and I remember watching it and thinking it was so inspiring to see that they shut down a WTO meeting, and it was just huge, and that really, really helped it pick up some momentum. Now, in terms of the Seattle protests, I don't, I'm also going to say I don't really think it was so much led by anarchists. I believe you really did have a lot of NGO influence, a lot of um, institutions that were very much top-down bureaucratic. They may have had, and they certainly did have, sincere people in there. And you had militant actions by anarchists, the Black Bloc, who um, kind of got blown out of proportion by the press. But what's different about Occupy is not only broader in terms of its public support and its participants, but also in terms of militancy, that certain um, anarchist tactics, perhaps, sort of stigmatized but in the Seattle protests have kind of become almost mainstream in the Occupy movement. And the, C the Seattle protests and those that came after in Quebec City and furthermore were massive. And many of these protests, in fact, dwarfed many of the Occupy rallies. And at least in the, and in that case, both movements kind of represent the majority of the population who are not being served by the existing state, the existing system. And in the case of, but in terms of Occupy is, of course, to Seattle. See, Seattle was really just taking up these financial institutions, really, globalization in some, at times, almost amorphous sense. Although there were more focused critiques within the anti-globalization movement. But Occupy is much different, in my view, because it's taking up the needs and concerns of the 99%. What does it mean to be for the 99%? You have to talk about women. You have to talk about racism, immigration, and so on and so forth, for close homes and whatnot. And furthermore, and one of my panelists mentioned this, is Occupy is different because in this point we are talking about this movement is taking place in the midst of a massive crisis of the capitalist system. The US government officially recognizes an unemployment rate of nearly 9%. It is certainly much higher than that because government figures are always too low. Yet the prospects for college graduates of the long-term unemployed, not to mention traditionally oppressed communities, are certainly bleak. And this system is telling us that we have to cut benefits, we have to close austerity, and so on and so forth. And in terms of the major differences in the movement as opposed to Seattle, when Seattle there was still the boom, 
the 90s were in full swing, and now it's over. There is no American dream. Not that it really existed, but let's just leave that aside. And there are, there are no jobs now. And there are wars. There's democratic or republican austerity. Take your pick. And, and something else about Occupy is it's about Occupy. Spaces are being taken over. This really wasn't done in Seattle. And new communities were developing, in certain sense, it, with contradictory forces, to be sure. Instead of an atomized society, we had people coming together, people t entering into dialogue, and we were retaking the commons. Because a lot of Occupy, at least initially, was very much parks, public spaces. It wasn't even talked about occupying factories or private property. And this idea was very much antithetical in many respects to the prevailing logic of capital, which is very much about private property about privatizing. And we have people occupying a physical space and learning to rule themselves without masters and the powers of being. And again, this is a very contradictory process. Not pure, no process ever is. And Occupy is a fissure from the possible politics of the system and has opened up the prospects of the politics of the impossible. And people, by that I mean people determining their own destiny. And another point is the state is perhaps even more oppressive in its dealings with protests now than during Seattle and, the, and its aftermath. And a, a big reason for this is, of course, 9-11. There was the development of homeland security and a, other major expansion of police power. And this is not to say that before 9-11 the state was in any sense good or responsive to the needs of the, the 99%. It certainly was not. It serves the interests of the capitalist class. It always has. And for example, something else that I've noticed in terms of Occupy, at least from my personal experience in Boston, is there's very much a, a tendency that seems to want to appeal to the state. I don't think it's a majority, but I think it's there. And they appeal to the police or courts for help. There was the whole trying to get a stay, an injunction so that the camp wasn't evicted going through the, the powers that be. And that somehow the, move, the state, the powers that be, could be moved to support us if we came up with reasonable demands. Ultimately, that didn't help. The place, our, our encampment was still infected. And the state and its representatives are part of a vast exploitive system known as capitalism that pursues only profit at whatever cost. And despite maybe the subjective intentions of many movement participants, they're coming up against this very harsh reality. And that, in a sense, those illusions are being shattered, and the process continues. So one, one thing that sort of then seems to come, to come out of these answers is that we started with, like, in, in, uh, in Seattle, but also sort of, you know, I think through much of the 90s, um, there, was, there was sort of like, um, there was a boom. And so uh, perhaps there was less reason for people to actually be involved in, in political action at the scale, at least, at which people seem to be doing now. That's sort of one of the, the, the other thing that sort of uh, comes out also is that, uh, that um, in Seattle, maybe uh, sort of America just got a sort of glimpse of what global politics can be. And, and now, it's only now that we're sort of like coming into our own after being maybe, you know, held back by 9-11 and like, all the sort of, you know, the wars. Um, the thing, of course, that sort of distinguishes the now from sort of the 90s is, you know, the economic crisis, or as you know, some of you call it, the crisis of capitalism. So I guess the question then is, like, is, is the Occupy movement uh, anti-capitalist at all? Or would you characterize it as anti-capitalist? Um, is it, and sort of, you know, as part of that would be sort of other ideas, such as, you know, is this is this class war? I mean, you know, I don't expect like all of those ideas to be taken seriously because a lot of them are sort of ideas that have been hyped up by the media. But really, the question of what is, how does the, um, I guess, on, uh, the question of anti-capitalism on the one hand, and, uh, and sort of the other question that goes hand in hand with that, which is uh, internationalism in politics, which is sort of the only form that anti-capitalist politics could take. How do those two things sort of work with uh, with the Occupy movement? How does Occupy sort of affirm or reject some of the sort of history that it has inherited from the 20th century? What does it do for itself? Well, I'm not affiliated with Occupy, 
Um, so I won't speak for it to, to say whether it is or isn't anti-capitalist, but I think that it is an expression of discontent with the, the status quo uh, and it's, it's an expression of discontent with policies and institutions that have exploited people and an expression of discontent with the political system that has been heavily influenced, to say the least, by those economic institutions uh, and has provided, uh, if, you, if I want to speak in a benign way, provided an, an institutional space whereby people can be exploited, whether through uh, their employers or through their creditors or through uh, any mechanism that the capitalist system has. Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily anti-capitalist, but I think it is expressing a lot of discontent with the way things have been run. And it's about time since people seem to be oblivious to the fact that uh, that income distribution has created a chasm between the haves and have-nots. Uh, I mentioned that I'm a professor at a college. I, about two or three years ago, before all of this started taking place and before um, before the crisis really had hit home, uh, I showed a video to my students. Uh, they were all first-year students in college. And the video in literally graphic uh, uh, depiction showed the difference in income between the median income in the United States and the top 1%. And it did it with a football field showing the median uh, on the, uh, in dollars on the 50-yard line, that the median income uh, in the United States in dollars would only be somewhere around a few feet tall if you stacked up all the different hundreds. Whereas the top 1%, if you stacked up all their hundreds, would rise into the stratosphere. This is a video you can see on, online. Um, and my students, what shocked me was my students, for the most part, thought that that was okay and that's the way it should be. And they iterated the, uh, the adage, you know, in America there's opportunity and if you work hard you should be able to make as much as Bill Gates or the Waltons who own Walmart or uh, whomever it is. And that this disparity between the rich and the so-called middle class is just. I think that finally the, the the sense of outrage at that is beginning to spread uh, into the middle class, and I think that's where its um, power really uh, will come from. And as far as the question about class warfare, the accusation that Obama was starting class warfare with his uh, tax plan, uh, I, I actually was more shocked at Obama's response to it, which was to try to deny it, rather than standing out in front of that accusation and saying, this is class warfare because for too many years now, the rich have been pillaging the everybody else. And it's about time that we have some sort of response from our political leaders to that uh, pillaging. This country was founded by people who were in fear of the power of a monarchy. When it was founded, there was no such thing as a corporation. In the beginning of the, the 1900s, there were only a handful of corporations in the United States, none of 
which had more than 100 employees working for them. The imagining the scope of, of corporate power in America was beyond the realm of the imagination of the, the framers of the Constitution. And it was frankly not what they were afraid of. Uh, but today, I think we need to be aware of the fourth branch of government, which is corporate power and corporate greed. And there needs to be new uh, devices in place to put a check <coughs> and balance on that. Um, and so I, I think that this the Occupy movement is expressing an outrage to the fact that there is no check or balance on corporate greed today. Is Occupy anti-capitalist? Um, as a member of a cadre organization, I've worked in various mass organizations that promote workers' rights, um, the environment, and anti-imperialist groups. And these organizations were reformist in the traditional one in a sense, which isn't to imply that they were somehow bad or ill-conceived, but simply to acknowledge that they weren't going to go all the way by themselves. Occupy is unique because it's essentially the reverse. Because it is occupying public spaces, foreclosed homes, and stretching the limits of bourgeois legality, in fact, using our bourgeois rights in a non-bourgeois way, <clears throat> it is objectively anti-capitalist. Yet strangely enough, it is also subjectively liberal. Most occupiers coalesce around ending corporate personhood, repealing the Glass-Steagall Act, or ending corporate donations and elections, while engaging simultaneously in anti-capitalist actions like occupations and so on. What a strange contradiction, and that's something we definitely have to figure out. Is it simply a matter of aligning subjective sympathies of the occupiers with objective ones? Is this what Mao talked about when he said something like the superstructure always lags behind in base in a social formation? <clears throat> I want to talk about um, the much maligned 99% 1% debate, because I know a lot of people um, have been criticizing these two terms. I'm, in, I'm definitely in favor of flesh, uh, fresh language. But I'm going to make a bold statement and say that the 99% 1% nomination is the resumption of class struggle, even the production of class itself through a political movement. The terms 99 and 1 are representative of a real bifurcation in social space, those who are not dispossessed and those who are. In this sense, we really do have classes named 99 and 1, but that is also problematic. There are real contradictions in the 99%, and the name in itself is vaguely populist. Maybe it can even be considered a form of American Chavismo. There is a bottom of the 99% composed of people of color and those with oppressed gender configurations, which are not represented within the Occupy movement to a high degree, except in Oakland and Atlanta. These forces have demands that need to be articulated, adopted, and promoted. The term 99% is often used to promote an artificial unity that smacks of white supremacy under the guise of post-racism. Regardless of the problems, I do see 99% and 1% as being indicators that class struggle in a political sense is now on the upsurge and a further clarification of these names can only be brought about by further action and discussion. Yeah, um, I think, uh, I guess first I would do my English uh, department routine and ask after the question of capitalism um, as a sort of discrete term. I think that what's so striking about the difference currently between what we would call the anarchist contingent and what we would call the sort of, I guess, you know, uh, socialist, because they're both Marxists, but the, whatever, the social standard, I guess, is precisely what is sort of necessary to defeat capitalism. And David Graeber gave this sort of stump speech that I saw before this whole thing started about how, how he studies in ecology because it's sort of concrete evidence of other non-capitalist ways of living. That sort of, um, it's a real sort of knee-jerk reaction on the part of the left to imagine capitalism as this sort of theological, all-pervasive thing that exists everywhere and at all times. Um, and that it's really important to just simply stop making capitalism, to just really live your life uh, at the level of what you otherwise in such a way so as to avoid creating or regenerating capitalism. I mean, and there's some sort of specific stuff about what that would mean. Um, and this is sort of very different than a, a sort of idea of a, of, a, of a structural or sort of systematic revolution. Um, and so I think that anti-capitalism as a term covers up that difference, right? Because one can both be anti-capitalist insofar as one is like going to the woods, as we talked about, and sort of forming an alternative kind of community, and one can also be anti-capitalist insofar as one is forming an armed vanguard and overthrowing the apparatus of the bourgeois state. So, um, is it anti-capitalist? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think most clearly at the level of culture, um, which is that if, if, you, if you get into the sort of abstract his, you know, ideology of it, I, I'm not sure you find any sort of coherence worth remarking on, but certainly at the level of culture and so far as what people are doing at the occupations, why they go, 
um, is because of a sort of master final vocabulary that is broadly anti-capitalist. When people criticize each other, they criticize each other for doing things that seem capitalist. When they talk about what makes the movement good, they talk about it being otherwise than things that are broadly considered to be capitalist. I think that the entire vocabulary of the thing, regardless of the sort of um, conceptual truth of it, is, is absolutely anti-capitalist. I don't see how it could possibly be anything else. Um, now, we can talk about whether it's effective anti-capitalism or sort of the different kinds of it that, that go into it, but um, absolutely, uh, it's anti-capitalist. In terms of the question of class struggle or class war, um, I think these, these two terms are also very different. Um, class struggle originally, I think, you know, was the sort of engine of, or sort of posited as a sort of engine of history. So even if it wasn't, um, didn't have any sort of surface manifestations at the level of the current configuration of ideological state apparatuses, you would always say the class struggle was still going on, was still taking place anyway, still sort of driving things forward. Um, and actually, I think you have a pretty good bunch of evidence over the last 20 to 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall. That's exactly what's been going on. Um, so to say that does this is this a resumption of the class struggle? Well, it's not clear. I think the class struggle ever went away. Can people imagine themselves participating in a class war? No, I don't think so. And I think that's one of those great Republican terms like political correctness, which is basically a smear term, um, because and they focus tested it to make sure that it's a smear term. And so far as people feel uncomfortable with being part of a class war, um, so I don't necessarily see that as an operating motivation for people. No one has been like, oh, beautiful day for a class war, although we do sometimes under joking. But I mean, it's not, I don't think that's really something that people see themselves participating in. I think in the sort of triumvirate of options between reform, revolution, and separatism, uh, I see no indication of any sort of revolutionary action at all. There's no, no vanguard organizing, no question of seizing power, I mean, no sort of tactics or strategy worthy of the name. Really, you're dealing with reform and separatism as the sort of main avenues of um, of what the occupation is doing. Well, this movement, I would say, is not explicitly or subjectively anti-capitalist, but it very much, the very terms of the debate are anti-capitalist. If we just look at the 1% versus the 99, there's a cry against the injustices that the 1% has perpetrated upon the 99%. And in a sense, you could say it's a simplified version of workers versus capitalists. Although, as other panelists have pointed out, um, the term 99% is itself contradictory. There's problems of racism, gender, immigration that have to be dealt with in this. But in term, in, although this debate, in many senses, is framed in a quasi-anti-capitalist way, and it is not explicitly or subjectively, say, there, the remedies that are proposed are really just scratching the surface of the problems we face. We have calls to abolish the Fed, tax the rich, campaign finance reform, glass uh, reinstate Glass-Steagall, help the Democrats who've never helped us, and all of these are pretty much inadequate, they, yet that's not the point. And there are people who look at Occupy and they criticize all that, this, that comes out of it because these things are debated. Well, my answer is, really, what do you expect? These people are waking up. And in many sense, people are waking up after years, decades of oppression, being lied to by a system, by an educational process that does not care about their development, that just wants to make them obedient workers and consumers. And everyone who's coming, these awakening people are coming in to occupy sites, or what were at least in Boston occupy sites, with their own background and their own consciousness formed in a unique way through this system. And some have been beaten down all their lives by those on the top. Others have been workers who produce enrichment for the 1% and receive poverty in turn. Others receive education without knowledge. Still more outcasts of society cast aside and shunned. Sometimes these outcasts can grasp the meaning of their, in their situation. For some who come to occupy, they endure feelings of deepening alienation and despair while seeking to give voice and meaning to it. And this happens through conversations that develop at Occupy, spontaneously that were occurring. And many of those who have been to Occupy Boston in its opening days can attest to you could form a circle and people would gather around and air their grievances. And the topics that were for discussion were not those that you would normally see in a so-called free society that we were ta we talk about the role of advertising, alternative forms of energy, the nature of work, alienation, exploitation. Questions are raised at a rather blinding speed, if you ask me.
for instance, where does wealth come from? Who gets what and why? What is capitalism? Why do our politicians ignore us? Who's Karl Marx? What is socialism? And there's a feeling that although the system capitalism doesn't work, again, the system is sometimes not given that explicit name, but it can very much, if you prod someone, you can perhaps get the answer. There is definitely a mistrust of old anti-capitalist movements for their real and perceived failures and authoritarianism. And there is a lot of truth to this. I think one of the most disheartening actions of the left has been trying to repeat old formulas from the sidelines, as if just invoking the magic names of, say, Lenin, Trotsky, or Mao is enough, as if their formulas, as interpreted by groups preaching on the sidelines, as many of them are, will suddenly be adopted, and the revolution can then be made. Sorry, the revolution isn't made in such a nice cookie cutter, put it in an easy bake oven and it comes out. What is necessary is to apply the methods of these great activists in order to repeat the same gesture, as Zizek would, would um, put it. That means reinventing the revolutionary project, learning from the masses, suspending the existing ideological parameters, and thinking anew. Or as I would like to put it, using the mass line. In this atmosphere, anarchism with its seemingly hatred hatred of all forms of authority looks much more appealing, although it is certainly not universally accepted at Occupy. <coughs> and this distrust of the current system, which is undemocratic, has left a high level of disgust at any form of leadership at Occupy. And as Lenin once said when referring to anarchism, it is or the ultra left, it is very much the price that the, uh, the labor movement plays for opportunity, the pace for opportunism. We have that sort of going in a certain direction. In many general assemblies, particularly in Boston, it was difficult to talk about political issues. It was difficult to talk about forming demands, which I actually don't want. It was difficult to talk about capitalism or socialism. And there's a real fear of appealing to the powers that be because they will co-opt and divide us. This means that the development of any form of leaders should not be encouraged because they will be co-opted. At least that was how I would perceive the thinking. And I actually see this as a rather healthy instinct to a certain degree. We really don't want to appeal to the Democrats or the capitalist state in any way. It isn't our state, it never has been, it never will be. It belongs to the enemy, the 1% of the capitalist class. Yet the distrust of traditional politics, which is not transparent, as we can all attest to, at the, at the this at times with the General Assemblies makes the process become cumbersome, that it tries to be so transparent that it becomes bogged down in procedure. And this can be rather annoying if you're standing out in the cold for six hours. And this makes it hard to discuss politics in such an atmosphere. Although to be fair, politics is discussed far outside the General Assemblies in various occupations, in the various study circles that form, in the free school universities that at least Boston have <laughs> new conversations that have been engendered. And even in the media, that, however distorted, these debates are sort of creeping in. And this debate needs to continue. Old ideas such as capitalism and racism must be challenged and overcome in our practice. And our practice is not just fetishizing the General Assembly, but engaging in the movement as a whole through a mass line approach. But the, uh, okay, I'm just going to quickly, I think I'm slightly unhappy with the time, in the sense that maybe we should go a little faster, uh, so that we have more. Q &A. Can I suggest right. that, that, I mean, a lot of people have come here and, and to give voice to the, the masses, maybe we should open it up for um, discussion? Uh, I, if you want to do that, I mean, like, I had a couple of questions that I thought would, in a certain sense, like, I could maybe skip a couple of them, but there's, there are two questions. One is sort of the question of demands, uh, which has been coming up, uh, why whether we should be making demands or not at all. Uh, I think that's something that maybe we could talk about and then there's another question, what does it mean for the off movement to succeed? I think, I think we should address both of those. Yeah, I think both of those we can we can we can have we have the room for a while. We still have, you know, enough time. It's not been that long. So so yeah, I mean we could talk about, you know, the question on the one hand of uh, <coughs> sort of uh, the question of like cooperation of the movement by various groups on the one hand and on the other hand the idea that you know you're not making any demands or like those the accusations of not making demands rather if you put it sort of uh, correctly um, and the fact that uh, not making demands could of course leave you open to be sort of co-opted I suppose but on the other hand making any would undermine the sort of 
open-endedness of this movement, which is really what everyone's been fascinated with as well, and that is what, as we sort of like hear from you, also seems to be the most sort of empowering aspect of it as well. Um, yeah. Well, and uh, I'm going to try to answer both those questions mm -hmm. in uh, a succinct way. So first of all, in terms of demands and being co-opted, I think that uh, I don't personally think that uh, Occupy should be making any demands um, because, as you said, part of the fascination with this is that people are there and they're saying, we are here, basically. We are here. And you can't just, you know, you can't just take our houses and the houses that we worked hard to get and that we signed into these, these uh, uh, predatory mortgages. Uh, these are people who are saying, we are here, you can't just lay us off and hope that we're going to go away when our unemployment runs out and we're no longer a statistic. They're saying, we are here and you can't just uh, pay us a minimum wage and not give us any health benefits. People are just saying, we are here without anything more. And I think that that is uh, an incredibly powerful political statement. And I think when you start making certain demands, uh, then you uh, diffuse that political statement. Um, and it, it, it begins to look like um, something more than representing those people who have uh, heretofore been unheard and unseen. In, in terms of uh, success for Occupy, I think that for me, what I see is um, not a violent overthrow of the, uh, of the entire political and economic system, but rather, as I suggested earlier, that something is created, uh, I, I would like to see it as an amendment to the Constitution, that would recognize the fact that, uh, that money and corporate America are basically a fourth branch of government and that we need to create a structure that's going to limit that in terms of its political clout and in terms of uh, the injustices that can be perpetrated on people through having a, a, a discrepancy in, in uh, wealth uh, that is unfathomable just in terms of its sheer, uh, the, 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 the way that it's completely out of proportion with anything that, that uh, would resemble a just distribution of wealth. Um, I think that uh, this question of being co-opted is very, dangerous one because what we see on the right, at least it's my belief, what we see among uh, Republicans and people on the right is that the blue collar worker has been completely co-opted by a stealth, uh, manipulative, and very intelligent uh, uh, group of intellectuals uh, who have basically uh, convinced them through their rhetoric to vote in ways that are diametrically opposed to their own interests. And I think it's very dangerous for um, intellectuals on the left to try to take over a movement that is really grassroots and that uh, has not been a political puppet of certain interest groups or of certain uh, parties or certain uh, movements uh, in order to further their own interests. This is uh, a grassroots movement that basically is saying we are here and that's, that's the message. The, as, as the courts showed, the means is the message. So do I address all three questions? Well, you can address two or three. I mean, I, I would like to really know what does it mean, what do you think to, it would mean for the movement to succeed? So I mean, I would like to hear you speak to that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Okay. So I'm going to address the questions of blockation demands and then what it's like to succeed. Um, 
It's actually a practical example of co-optation that I talked about there. Um, so me and Doug are both in the Socialist Caucus at Occupy Boston. And some people have been vying to pass a resolution which they think will prevent co-optation. It basically states that the Occupy Boston movement is not in the business of supporting Democrats or Republicans in any particular way, through voting or through tactical alliances, so on and so on. But I, I think this is strong moralistic garbage, and we should probably throw it out. There is a strong tendency on the left to purify the occupation movement to its hardcore of leftists and sectarians, ignoring thousands of working people who have been awakened by this movement. And I will get into the reason now why I consider the focus on co-optation to be moralistic and bizarre. In New York City, progressive city councilors blocked, blocked against Bloomberg and played a decisive role in saving Zuccotti Park from expulsion. What is actually wrong with engaging in short-term tactical alliances with Democrats in order to, to permit breathing room for the movement? Preventing co-optation will not be accomplished by bureaucratic maneuvers like simply changing the messaging of the Occupy Boston or the Occupy movement in general. Time is better spent organizing in committees and changing the mass perspective from within. Otherwise, we are engaging in a form of commandism which limits the involvement of uh, oppressed and exploited peoples. It does indeed resemble moralism rather than politics. Politics takes into account the conjecture and develops appropriate strategy and tactics. And certainly, what's to say that the focus on co-optation can't be used against the communist anarchist or otherwise radical left? How could this prevent occupiers from proposing an equally disastrous document which agitates for the dismissal of communists and radicals from the movement, which is what happened in Occupy uh, Toronto? And I also think um, what is it? there's another city in Canada that did something similar. So there's a danger of co-optation by any sector. But something that's really important to note is that the consensus model is pretty much antithetical to being co-opted. Things are changing at every moment. Literally, declarations get passed every day and then overturned. And you know, a lot gets done in these very long hours of, of consensus work. So I know one time Move On tried to organize at Occupy Boston. They sent out a letter. There was some strong discussion about whether they should be allowed to come, so on and so on. But basically, it just quietly went away. No one really cared about it. It wasn't really essential, and they didn't provide any support to the GA or provide any analysis of the GA. So I really, I really think the focus on co-optation is something that is used by sectarian leftists and other groups to purify the movement in such a way that they literally want to take command of it and maybe dismiss it. And I was going to talk about um, you know, the Longshoremen Union and so on and so on and, and the solidarity that we've had with them. But I'm going to skip to demands. So I think that's more important. Um, demands are a complicated question. Right? Some feel that given occupies distance from the state, no demands should be maintained. Others feel that there are too many problems and so demands are precluded. But Occupy needs to address something in the future. Yet, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think you can have demands without having demands. And one way that you can have demands without having demands is just having Occupy Boston be an organization that has campaigns. And if you have focused campaigns on a number of issues, then you're not essentially adopting a, adopting a central demand which would turn you into a focus group or a pressure group. If Occupy becomes a pressure group, I don't think anyone would go to the meetings. They'd expect like any bureaucratic organization to take care of that stuff for them. But if it turns into an uh, organization that launches campaigns that are inclusive, use the same model, the same horizontal consensus model, and so on, I think, I think that could work out very well. Now in terms of winning, what does it mean for Occupy to win? You know, like when Bush had like victory or whatever on the, on the boat. Well, I think we should proclaim it right now. We should have a big sign that says, we've won. Well, we really have won quite a bit. Um, the ideological coordinates of Americans has pretty much been totally shifted. The post 9 11 consensus is, is done with. People are taking to the streets. They're destroying common sense. The police are being used in a number of violent ways. So I think, in one really strong way, is that we've won. Everyone's talking about Occupy from community groups in Somerville, like Safe Our Somerville, to City Life, to just normal people on the street who are just talking about stuff or happened to walk by Dewey Square when it was still there. But I think, more tangibly, if Occupy had a national convention or something of that, nature and became actual base areas for something greater, for stronger political intervention to actually change the daily life of the United States. I think that would be a win-win situation. Yeah, um, I think I found myself right. Um, but uh, I think actually, to take these questions in reverse, um, I think the question of demands and cooptation are actually bound up with the question of success, because I think people are frightened of demands and worried about co-optation to the extent that they don't know what winning would look like. Uh, if they knew what winning would look like, they would be able to tell very clearly, well, this is something that makes sense, or, or I think it, it doesn't. You could have a sort of argument the level of strategy or tactics if the goal was clear. Um, because the goal is not clear, I think there is a sort of um, 
habit of falling back on a sort of authenticity claim um, that I, I think is, is basically pretty destructive um, because it, the uh, I was talking to my professors here actually and she was talking to her undergrads and undergrads were always saying that oh you know we, we're sort of vaguely in sympathy but we don't feel like we can protest because it would be hypocritical um, because they imagine that being Harvard undergrads they are always already part of the one percent or, or, or something you know um, and I think that that is a function of the sort of same instinct that goes at this question of cooptation um, that, that basically obliterates the possibility of having a political identity separate from a sort of social or cultural one that one actually can, can stand in and advocate for anything um, regardless of where one comes from. Um, so insofar as people are concerned about cooptation, they don't, they're unclear about what it means to be part of this movement and they're confusing a basically sort of like a bastardized or impoverished identity politics for a politics of practice or action. So to that extent, uh, I think the occupations have already been a success. I think they've already won. Um, but I also think that all the left does is win, <laughs> um, which I know is sort of a, a, a minority position. I think if you look at the last 50 or 100 or 200 or 300 years of human history, I think it's just one long procession of leftist victories. Um, and I, so I don't know of any sort of argument, empirical or otherwise, that uh, is otherwise than that. Um, yeah, of course, there's setbacks and these sorts of things, but the general trend has been one of leftist victory. Uh, and I think that will continue, and I think that the occupations are just another step in that direction. Um, so, uh, to that extent, it doesn't actually answer the question, all right, so what would it look like to win? Um, and I think that the demands question, to get to the one I haven't addressed, is really the question of reform. Um, and it's something that I do struggle with a lot. Um, on the one hand, I think that even if reform was your actual goal, on our case could be made that sort of maintaining this infinitely demanding position is actually the best way to achieve reform. That the longer you're in the field and not saying what it is you want, the more the other people who aren't necessarily in camp but who are sympathizers will sort of get active. Um, and so that actually is a sort of performance of a revolutionary position in the service of reform. Um, separate from that, uh, I think, I always go back to that moment in Emma Goldman's autobiography, I think it's in like the end of volume one, right, where she has that moment where she's totally against reforms, and then she meets this like 87-year-old coal miner who's been in the coal mine for 60 years, and it's just like, wouldn't it be great if I could not work for like two years at the end of my life? And then Goldman was like, yeah, I can't really tell you that you should continue working in that coal mine, so we hold out for revolution. And that's sort of the exact sort of anecdotal bullshit, like non-conceptual thing that like is not really <laughs> something I'd like to base an argument like this on. But at the same time, that's the thing that sticks with me um, is that I feel myself like it is very easy for someone like me to make a sort of commitment against demands or in favor of revolution um, because the status quo is really not that difficult. Um, and so I, I honestly don't feel like it's for me to say. Um, I will say I, I don't. I've yet to encounter a sort of concrete historical example of, of the kind of revolution that would be looked for in a putatively democratic society taking place. I think if you look at what's going on in the Arab Spring and all those other things, these are revolutions because they are against a concentrated power figure. Uh, I think that so the sort of national liberation discourse that takes place at the periphery is of a radically different kind than the kind of autonomous organization that happens at the center. Um, regardless of whether or not this country is actually a democracy or not, I think that it, it does change the kind of strategy. Um, I'm not sure it makes sense to speak of revolution in the sort of at, at the center of the world system. Um, and I think that demands, the, the refusal of demands, unless you want to take a position that it's uh, in service of reform, is a sort of implicitly revolutionary position. Again, it could be a separatist position, but I don't know what that would mean. Well, earlier I said I wasn't in, in favor of demands. I just want to clarify that slightly. I'm actually in favor of one demand, and it goes to something James Connolly said, a very moderate demand, where he said, we just want the earth. So that's pretty much my one demand that I'm willing to make on the system. We just want the earth back. Now, it, but in general, though, I don't really want demands. I think what we should do, and Evan sort of touched on it, is working on a project or a campaign, for instance, a friend of mine is really pushing for a debt jubilee, a cancellation of all student debts, or really all debts, and I think that's a great idea. And because I think if we were actually demand something from the powers of be, whether it's tax the rich, or brings us back to something I think kind of the Jewish is like, 
brings us back to the state of the possible. And it's hoped by certain sectors in the movement, liberals and others, that if we agitate loud enough, if we elect the right people through our movement and play by the rules of the game, that we can make the rich pay just a little bit more. We can make the system a little more bearable. And perhaps that's true. You know, the electoral process can produce some positive changes. It has. But um, it's still the politics of the possible. And pretty much the basic system would still remain, the system that oppresses and exploits people here and around the world. And the truth is, I'm not fighting for that. I don't want this movement to result in, say, a massive break from the Democrat <coughs> Party of a lot of its social base, only to channel it back in there. And that, that would just be a, a defeat for this movement when we should really be trying to break from it. So where does that leave us then? Or to raise an old question by a comrade of mine, what is to be done? And I want to speak to something Evan touched on about base areas. And I believe that one of Marx's great insights here by Lenin is that the, the workers cannot merely use the state for its own purposes. In order to carry a revolution, the capitalist state must be smashed, and we must build red political power, like the Paris Commune, Russian Soviets, and base areas in China. And these examples hardly exhaustive of red political power envision a new way of doing politics. And this way of politics is to practice the impossible. And impossible in one way. But the logic of capitalism, workers and peasants, or the 99% to use our parlance, should not be able to determine their own destiny, so should not be able to rule. And they should not be able to build a better world. And we're always told there is no alternative. This is the best of all possible worlds. Yet the 99% can build a new world. They can emancipate themselves. And that is the truth of this movement. That is the truth that socialists, communists, and radicals must pledge fidelity to you to and carry that commitment through to the end. And occupies the event. It has sparked this new people coming aware, coming away, um, experiencing decades of uh, education in mere weeks. And this truth of a self-emancipation of a new society is very much embedded with it. And people are taking their destiny. And despite the very contradictory processes of cumbersome GAs and quarrels among the inhabitants, drug use and old values, it's still happening. And I really expect this contradictory process to, to really to occur because you can't expect people to suddenly become new people, a new people overnight. It's a process. It takes time. And I believe that radicals, communists, and socialists must be the heart of this process. This shouldn't just mean, as Evan was speaking to, just trying to get the movement to, through some bureaucratic process to adopt our positions, but to be working within it through various working groups through using a mass line approach. And we must be very much immersed and occupy the site of emancipation in every way. And we should be doing what we can to expand Occupy, to perhaps whether it's foreclosed homes or perhaps taking over um, the places at the point of production and oppressed community neighborhoods and make it the base of red political power. So I believe we should be accelerating the break with the Democrats and we should be very much pledging ourselves as faithful subjects of truth. And in terms of success, uh, I, believe, I agree with what other participants said. In, we really actually have achieved a lot in a mere two or three months. And just shifting the debate, just shift, shattering the 9-11 consensus. But I believe the ultimate goal for this movement should be the complete and total irrevocable overthrow of this system and the putting in place of a new system with a 99% rule. And the truth is that's not going to be an easy process. It's going to be a long, hard struggle. It's not going to happen in the next two or three months as much as some of us here may want it to. And we will be facing the problems of eviction, of co-optation, jail. But I believe ultimately this system is irreformable, and we can perhaps patch it up slightly. But our goal should be ultimately to destroy it. All right. Uh, so we can uh, probably start taking audience questions now. Anyone wish to start? I was promised there were other questions. Yeah, I'm curious. Um, uh, thinking about um, the problem of history and in terms of historical moments. Um, I'm curious about the role. Let's, let's move the subject. Uh, if I move the subject away for a bit from material forces towards ideas, and I'm wondering if the, the participants here have any ideas about 
perhaps what we might think of as shifts in consciousness. And one thing that um, is notable to me is that I do think there was a, there was a shift in consciousness. This, according to Kent, of course, understanding that you can't talk about changes in consciousness without talking about changes in production, but let's, let's put aside the two of us for a second. Think about what appears to me to be a, a rather striking shift in consciousness that happens in the 1970s, particularly that decade and around the world. And one of the hallmarks of that shift in consciousness, to quote, this is not, this is not my idea, this is an idea of a number of historians, Bruce Shulman is, is the foremost. The idea that, as Bruce Shulman put it, um, the protesters at People's Park in the 60s were on the same side as Mary Daly. And what he means when he says that, of course, isn't that, you know, obviously they're on opposing sides, but there's a sense in that there was a, sh there was a shared, at least a, a kind of a shared uh, goal by the protesters of People's Park I mean, um, and, and the establishment at Mary Daly, that there was this, um, there was something of value or something to be either transformed, salvaged, or in the case of the reactionaries in the right wing, kept the same, two pre-existing institutions, whether that be the government, the nation state, um, the company. It seems to me that in this, the 70s is when you get this shift of Let's ignore those things. Let's, and of course, you could talk about destroying them, as, as Marxists do, as some Marxists do. Or you could talk about, let's abandon them. And let's separate our own, sort of, our own corner of the world, our own, our own sort of, you want to call it, separate identity, separate community. I, I, I think Schulman and other, other people talk about the CSS is, is actually quite, quite, a, quite a change in, in contemporary history and, 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 and quite significant in influencing all the politics to follow, including Occupying women. Does anybody have any ideas about this change in consciousness? Um, well, I think you're talking about the politics of subtraction, right? And I know that that's probably a hot topic right now, but you and so on. But there are certain groups that exemplify this trend. There's the MST or the Movement of Landless Workers in Brazil. They literally just occupy space like Occupy Boston does and other movements, right. and they they kind of like organize it on. Uh, commune-like basis and they have work teams and so on and so on. Kind of like collectivized production at a distance from the state, they're like abandoning these machineries in certain localized areas. There's the South African Shack Dwellers Movement, they do similar things, they operate on a block-to-block -block basis, they have communal power, so on and so on. There's of course the Zapatista right? So I'm wondering, you know, that, that kind of trend I guess is not new because we've had utopian socialist experiments before that tried to do the same thing. I'm wondering, you know, where that came from ideologically. And I guess it would have to come from to lose, or 1968 maybe, or even even some of the riots in Paris and so on. So this is definitely a trend that we're seeing, and I think Occupy certainly picks up on all these events starting in 68, starting with the MST and Zapatistas, and I think the goal here is that perhaps people think that by focusing on the state, uh, subjecting the state to violence or something like that, or trying to smash the state, that literally that, that kind of thing is impossible because the state traverses all of us and so on and so on. So the only thing you can really do is put yourself at some perpetual distance and forever remains like a small percentage of state somewhere that you're going to have to forever push away. But um, I, I guess I would locate that kind of shift in consciousness in 1968 in the Zapatista movement and the wide adoption by the anti-globalization movement of the Zapatista model. I want to ask what I'm just going to ask. Oh, ask. No, no, I'm just going to say keep the questions. Yeah, my question is going to be brief. Um, mine's kind of a two part question. And the first one is whether you were in favor of, or whether it was a good thing that the camp was evicted or not. And this is a uh, you know, subjective talk. And secondly, the matter of organization and how the eviction um, was in, in large part a result um, to the, uh, the fact that the people who were bringing the lawsuit were not properly plaintiffs, um, you know, like actually not having enough, not actually being properly incorporated, as it were, um, was the reason why um, they were evicted. Um, and whether or not that brings any, um, you know, that informs the future tactics or what you think will be future tactics. I'd like to speak to this question. Um, just in terms of the eviction, as, as it were, I actually think that the whole tactic of bringing, of trying to have us keep the camp at Dewey Square is actually a, a very good move by Occupy. I think it was actually a, 
a, a great way to make use of like kind of these little openings that we sometimes find in the state apparatus. Because by the, when this was go, when this was going to court, there had already been these evictions in Oakland and New York and so on and so forth. And the thing is, we we actually got probably maybe a, they probably wanted to get us up much earlier, but because of the eviction, we had the encampment for a while longer. But there was, in terms of the tactics of dealing with the eviction, it shows both great promise and, in a certain level, great frustration. Because just I was there Thursday night at Boston. I was not there Friday or into Saturday when the camp was evicted. And people came down Thursday, but I, I felt like at the General Assembly that night, before I, I left, they spent an hour talking about having a dance party and then just kind of leaving. And I, I'm all for having a dance party. I mean, I, I love to dance, but um, I, I don't think you should have a dance party in place of defending the camp. I mean, why not do both, you know? And I was kind of a little disheartened when I left because I, I actually didn't want to get arrested, so I went home. But I, I watched the news and people poured in there. It was this great potential. Hundreds, uh, probably more than a thousand, I'm, I'm horrible at estimating crowds, but so many people came in there to defend the camp and I think the police realized there's just too many people to jail, so they, they let the camp stay for at least an extra day. And the frustration was there; was, it really wasn't built. It just wasn't continued. This this great enthusiasm, and when the camp was finally evicted, the police tactically did their job very well. They waited out people. I know people who planned on getting arrested, and they left at like 4:30, thinking they're not going to come in, and they just left. And the police came in at 5 on a Saturday morning when there really wasn't much commute or passers-by. And in a certain sense, you know, it, you know, it's very dialectical. Yes, it was frustrating, but people are going to learn from this process how did the state operate, how did the courts operate, and um, what tactics can we use, like what's a way to keep this movement alive. So there's very much potential in that. So the thing about, uh, I just have a small point to make here. I come to your name. The thing about uh, evictions, in case Boston that we've spoken about, is also that Boston is not just to be square, that, that the occupation, I think especially in Boston, over other places, has really spread out, you know. So not only that, we are actually also, in some cases, we are occupying spaces of privilege, in a certain sense, occupy Harvard being a certain example, but we are also occupying, you know, the barrio, we are also occupying poor neighborhoods, we are occupying neighborhoods, you know. Occupy some of it, like you know, that's it's uh, it's it's actually very different from like so. The question of evictions really gets. I mean, I'm not asking this only to you, but sort of like it's almost like a follow-up question that it's almost like there are, there have been evictions, but yet there are people who are also sort of you know doing things who are still occupying, even if it's in like how does that then sort of change that? What what role would those play to sort of uh, what does it mean that Dewey loses primacy? Yeah, yeah like but no, have... not just, no, actually not that, but really that, that Dewey is no longer there, but yet Occupy Boston sort of continues in these, you know, in this disparate, uh, successful in their own senses, and yet sort of, you know, not, perhaps not connected to each other, sort of sense uh, um, almost little occupations. Yeah, I mean, I think, speaking for myself and some of the folks I've talked to, I think we all underestimated um, how hard it would be. I think we all sort of gotten to this plausible point where like, oh, can't this sometimes take advantage and sometimes kind of a mess and like, won't it be great to be liberated from having to tend to camp? Um, and I think that was wrong, um, which is not necessarily to say that it, it, it wasn't something that had to happen, but I think that we all really underestimated how, what, what, what that loss would be like. And I think we spent most of the last week sort of learning or just realizing that and sort of dealing with it um, in a way that I think been harder uh, for a lot of us than we anticipated, precisely because of what made camp so special. You know, I, as I was saying to my friend the other day, what was great about it is you could you could go and be part of it and not have to be at a meeting. You know, <laughs> like so you could go and, and not go to GA, but like lurk in the library tent and make fun of GA and still be part of something. You know, and like actually, this is a, a method of interacting that is more comfortable for a lot of people than showing up and just running from meeting to meeting. That it was good just to go and like volunteer or something very specific and then come home or see a class or something. There was so many ways to be involved, um, and in fact, just going there and doing nothing was a way of being involved. Um, 
And I think that when that when that community is gone, you know, it, it is it is a delicate thing. It, it is really it's not something you can just start up again, and it's not something you can just sort of move into some other series of actions or campaigns or whatever. Like, no, that actually was pretty specific. Um, so I think that. I, no, I think that's a good thing. And I think that especially the idea that it's the same whether the police take it down or we take it down ourselves, um, it, it's not the same. Um, it's actually much worse when the police come, I think. Which is not to say we should have taken it down ourselves, but I think that in retrospect that is sort of, that's a stronger distinction. Um, so I, I, as much as I'd like to say, like, yeah, it was great, this is the best thing that ever happened, I, I really can't, you know? Um, I think it sucks. Um, and I think a lot of us just can't go on. I think that um, it's, not so important whether it was there or whether it's not there, I think. It being there was great as a symbolic place where a lot of people could see it, it was very visible, and people could just say Dewey Square and everybody knew what you were talking about. I think that we're going to see also, as long as there is discontent at the levels that there are or higher, we're going to see spontaneous um, expressions of that discontent in many different ways. But what I think was really amazing about uh, both Occupy Boston and around the country where we saw interaction with uh, officialdom, if you will, uh, was it was so different from the 60s. And it, it was sort of like, in the 60s, both the, the system and the protesters to the system were, uh, had a lesson. One side was saying F you, and the other side was saying it right back, and there's a lot of violence, and there's a lot of, um, uh, a, a lot of conflict. And across the country, uh, with the Occupy Movement, we saw a much more mature interaction between um, mostly government officials and the police, and the people protesting, um, such that there Everybody knew that uh, violence was not what anybody wanted. Uh, there were ugly scenes that we saw um, play out in different cities, but for the most part, it was um, it was an adult population speaking to an adult population, and uh, like you said, the tactics were very uh, sophisticated, waiting it out rather than just being a, a show of force. You have until midnight, and then at midnight we're going to go in and take it away when like or not, and also on the part of Occupy, like you said, you didn't want to get arrested, so you walked away. Um, you know, people who wanted to get arrested, as part of their protest, did, but uh, for the most part, um, with certain exceptions, it was done in a, a, a manner that was um, uh, showing a lot of maturity on both sides. I think. And you did take immediate issue with everything. Yeah, I really disagree. Uh, and and I didn't First, I mean, to say that the camp was symbolic, it, it wasn't. It was a very real thing. There were homeless, unemployed families living there, depending on the services that they all offer, including the people that were living there. So it was a very real phenomenon. We were actually serving the people. I know we rendered about $500,000 in services to the city. So that's a real thing. So we had a real loss, actual, a real human loss when that camp was disbanded. So we can't forget these people who are the most excluded and exploited of the system. Secondly, to say that there was some maturity is lack of violence. I mean, that kid Scott Olson almost died. I think he might, I think he just got out. There's been violence from former leftists like Mayor Occupy Oakland a few times. There's been violence in Boston when they beat up uh, old veterans and, and people when we seized that second park on the Greenway. So I think violence pretty much pervades the movement. And I think one of the problems on our end is that we don't have an appropriate response to this kind of violence. Our response is simply not acting. For example, the whole issue with the sink coming in and, and so on, there was a lot of debate over it and stuff. But um, if we're actually going to take another physical space, which I hope that we do because the whole name Occupy really references taking spaces that people can live in and people can work in people can create themselves, then we need to figure out a different strategy. And I was thinking about the Bolivians again and how they really needed those plazas and those physical spaces to talk about political tactics and strategy they were going to make for that day, like during the gas war, they'd meet at the plazas and they'd disperse. Then they'd come back and all their villages were made in like really bizarre ways where the state couldn't navigate because they were all like tunnels and stuff. And so the Occupy Boston camp was kind of like that. You know, it was like a strange space where there were roads to nowhere, where things were uh, straight. And people actually made that space. 
what it was. So we need to find another space where we can do that, where we can meet and think together, and also plan and have a kind of dispersal reoccupation back and forth going on. Okay. So it's occurred to me, um, and I only visited Occupy sporadically, but it's occurred to me that before Occupy um, uh, struck the attempt that you had power, that you could have negotiated with Menino and you could have had an open debate or an open discussion and say, Mayor Menino, what is your agenda? And does your agenda include, you know, fighting the foreclosures, et cetera, A through Z? But I, you know, I invite your comments. Did, did, that, did that ever occur to you folks that you had that power? Oh, and then, and then once you had the debate with Medino, strike your tent. I mean, the city was actually ordered by the court to mediate with Occupy Boston, and the city effectively refused. Um, the people who went to the mediation sort of presented something, and the city basically presented something else, and the mediator came back and was like, yeah, there's not enough common ground. This mediation is all closed all the way. So actually, the judge originally said mediation, the city was like, well, we're not going to do that. The judge said, no, I don't think you understand. This is court-ordered mediation. You have to mediate with Occupy Boston. And the city was like, fine. Showed up, made what, I mean, we don't even know what they said to the mediator, but whatever it was, it was enough for them to come back after the first time and say there's not enough common ground to mediate. Um, I mean, separate from the sort of ideological question of it, I've been wanting to negotiate. Certainly lots of people were talking to the city. The city was never, ever, 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 ever interested in having any sort of conversation like that. Okay, so if that's a lost cause, by the end of this, by that Tuesday night, when you were supposed to be gone, but, but they didn't enforce it, I understand, I uh, wasn't watching the TV, I understand that the, uh, the news channels flipped to Occupy Boston for about two hours. So at that point, you had the media. So, okay, if the city doesn't respond to you, you know, throw it up into the media. Briefly, you had the media. Now I think that window's closed. When you say throw it up into the media, what do you, what do you, mean? you mean? If the city doesn't want to debate or doesn't want to discuss, you know, Occupy can, you know, if you will, show their platform of commonality with Menino. Menino, you don't endorse these things? Yeah, you know, it's, um, I, having been on the media team for Occupy Boston, I think the ability of us, of us to sort of dictate any kind of message to the media is greatly over overestimated. I know the day of our court hearing, we read a statement where we actually said, you know, Marie Menino has said X and Y about being sympathetic to our goals, therefore why is he not open an investigation with the Federal Reserve over the illegal loaning? Why is he not open an investigation into Bank of America over the robust? I mean, we like list like all the millions of things that he could possibly have done, you know, and actually later in the day, Coakley actually did start the investigation of Bank of America, so this is weird asking each other see a moment. But that was a sort of the purely tactical sort of thing to make that case, you know, and we had seven, ten media cameras recording it, none of them, no, none of them aired it. You know, they just wanted to talk about how filthy camp was. Yeah. Um, so I think that there was a lot of stuff that, even if it wasn't actually representative, was tactically designed to provoke people, provoke that kind of sympathy. Mm -hmm. um, never got through. So switching gears a little bit, back a while, you, you said that you know one of the kind of unifying themes, like you can get occupiers to agree on. Um, on being against kind of corporate Wall Street, like that's kind of the big overarching thing. So I guess my question is, to what extent is the Occupy Boston movement engaging with um, movements that are working to build kind of grassroots place-based alternatives to the corporate global economy? So like the local living economies movement or the transition towns movement, or the, I mean, they're not seeking to overthrow the state, but they are looking to develop really concrete, practical kind of other ways of doing business that are very place-based. I mean, I think insofar as Occupy Boston was a place-based movement against the global economy, like, you know, I think right. it's kind of a spectacular example of that. Um, I, I but in terms of, like, channeling, I guess in terms of channeling occupiers and kind of Occupy supporters towards these other channels and kind of making them aware of these other movements that are going on to build a different type of economy. I think actually a lot of those people were there anyway. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I think it's, it's a lot of the folks who came out, and at least in my experience, and you guys should jump in, but I think a lot of those exact people were the people that were occupied. Um, not all, all together, and so I think a lot of that energy is kind of filtering back. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not a conversation I've heard enough of. I don't know how you guys, what you guys experience. Yeah. 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 
there's gonna be projects in Occupy Sunnyvale to have like kind of a guerrilla gardening kind of thing to have like organic food places and so on, free dis distribution and so on. I know the food tent was organized by these very same people, so particularly people from UMass who have like a strong interest in alternative economies like credits and so on and so on. Um, but I'm not really aware of Occupy uh, Boston working officially with any kind of groups that uh, endorse this kind of strategy. Mm -hmm. But I know that a lot of people were involved in it because it literally did basically the same things. Yeah, I guess just the reason I ask is that often in the media I don't see the connection being made to like, you know, there's Occupy and then if you're interested in this, like, here are groups working on time banking or here are groups working on relocalization of the economy or like, what can practical people do to actually put these values into action in their, and how they spend their money. Yeah, it's funny. I, I don't know why that that act seems particularly confusing for the media. The media can understand like demands. They can understand like Wall Street bad. You know, they can understand like class war bad. You know, but when it comes to like alternative economies, that really jams their ears. <laughs> they, really, for some reason, they're just like they, it's, it's amazing because you just get the, the dumb stares are especially dumb when you bring up something like that. I don't know why it is, but it's true. It's so it seems like that might be a front for like something to tackle moving forward. Sure. <laughs> I, I just had a follow-up question. I'm sort of using my authority as my people say on the side of the table, actually. But I can I'll come I'll come to the people who want to ask questions. Okay, so I had a uh, the the no, the practice review number forty-two over there has an interview with uh, Zizek, in, and the first thing he actually says is that there is plenty of anti-capitalism in the world today. Uh, the problem that he sees with it is that it is all what he calls as sort of ethical anti-capitalism. And I think, you know, one thing that came out of the question that we had about anti-capitalism was that, you know, hell yes, there's, there's a lot of anti-capitalism, this movement is anti-capitalist in many, many ways. But one of the things that sort of evidence said that struck me was really that, you know, that it is anti-capitalist sort of objectively, but subjectively it actually has very little um, sort of uh, demands or goals. And I think the question of, uh, the way this plays out in, like, you know, the example in some of the for example, or, or something like that, where it ultimately becomes about local food or reinforcing or strengthening local economies or, you know, um, really about, uh, or even like, you know, uh, place making initiatives that sort of, you know, like come that ultimately will work with city governments. It's really like, you know, that sort of, uh, I think it's certainly in. Uh, if, if not a direct conflict, it is still sort of, you know, it, 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 is, it is a question that um, throws the, the, the problem of anti-capitalism into relief in a certain sense. That, that it, is, it is not wholly clear how those movements actually work together. And of course, the answer to this could very simply be that, you know, that is the nature of the occupied movement, that it is, you know, sort of uh, disaggregated, it actually has very, very different characteristics. But at the same time, it, it does seem like, you know, uh, the demands that do seem to sort of come out of the movement seem to be really these ethical um, uh, things, what, what I think Zizek called ethical in, the, in that interview. Uh, but really, um, yeah, okay, so that was just a point. We can, we can take, a, take another question, but I think I'm, I'll just encourage you to think about that. Uh, I think you have a question. I did, but I don't know oh, sorry. how to form it. No, 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 that's okay. I, um I'm obviously I'm not affiliated with Occupy Boston, and I think part of why I'm I'm not is because I have a problem. I don't know how to see myself and what my role in this sort of movement could be, and it's been really refreshing to hear, not so explicitly said, but that um, some of the great success of this movement so far has been that it's 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 cultural. Um, you were talking, somebody was talking a little bit earlier about. You know, being I just I take issue with this idea that the the camp was a sim it was symbolic because you actually had a culture and a community forming within it, even if it wasn't um, so loud and wasn't you know it, it wasn't something that you could uh, really clearly see from the outside. Um, but you know, I, I guess the the question that keeps coming up for me is how do I be part of something that claims from, you know, even from people, you know, self-proclaimed members of this movement, claims to be anti-capitalist when I don't really know what that would mean for me. And, you know, as somebody who, like, buys and uses Apple products, like, I don't know how <laughs> to identify as somebody who is aligned with an anti-capitalist movement. Um, and so I guess I don't even know if that's a question, but, like, that is, that is the constant problem for me. So, yeah. Should we get on the line on this one? <laughs> 
Yeah, I was just going to say that I'm personally one of those people who am, I'm not going to really get on someone's case if they say have an Apple product or they go to Walmart because unless you're able to absolutely drop out completely of society and make everything yourself, it's really a physical impossibility. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, if you, you know, someplace, Walmart's pretty cheap, you know, they pay their workers pretty bad, but, you know, you kind of, it's kind of part of the reality we have to live. And part of, I think, and this is something I've come up with certain uh, left groups that occupy, is anti-capitalists, uh, I think, a lot of them, they, they approach in a very mechanical, I would say, horrible way. They, it's like this, they try and reduce it all to this, like, purified notion of working class. You know, if we just advocate for, say, jobs as opposed to austerity, or we advocate for slightly higher wages, that somehow that will lead to anti-capitalism. But I think part of it is, and um, the idea of projects and campaigns, like, I don't know how many people here have student debt, but, you know, the whole idea of the jet debt jubilee, or pushing anti-foreclosures, I, I think like the, the debt jubilee is like an assault on private property or fighting evictions. Y you don't really need a whole sophisticated Marxist analysis to think there are homeless people and there are empty homes. And that to me strikes me as a way to get to bridge that gap slightly. And, and another point is I don't think people are so much going to be inspired to become anti-capitalist by fighting for a slightly higher wage, although I guess we'd all want that, or, you know, for a job when the whole system, like your job is alienated and exploitive, you know, you get inspired by grand ideas, bold visions, you know, ride the tiger like the sky, something like that. I mean, I think to respond to your question about, that's precisely what this question of, like, ethical anti-capitalism or romantic anti-capitalism or, or you know, insofar as um, this distinction between class consciousness and consumer consciousness, mm -hmm. uh, and that so much of what's happened over the past 30 and 40 years is a, is a substitution of one or the other, right? So people that adjudicate their own uh, anti-capitalist bona fides based on a, on a metrics of <coughs> what they consume. Mm -hmm. um, and this is actually very different than, <laughs> than sort of how things used to work, and I think how, at least I, I think people might want to consider working again in the future, which is that it's about um, commitment and action not so much about what you buy. I think people often imagine, like, well, I don't only have so much time, so the best way I can polit be political is to, like, buy appropriately or buy ethically, which is a good, a good thing to do, you know, sure. But I think that the idea that that is in any way analogous to or, or a substitute for, um, like, being a member of the Communist Party, which is I'm not suggesting you should do, but, like, that used to be the model. You know what I mean? Where you went to meetings, you contributed part of your income, and, like, this was a whole world that you were part of. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that what I learned being involved in Occupy was how uh, deeply we've internalized that, that idea. And it's really about us and our decisions, and, and less about what it is that we have decided to belong to. Uh, it took me three days to stop waiting for someone to yell at me when I was in the media tent. I kept waiting for someone to come up and be like, who are you? What are you doing here? You haven't been here long enough. Like, no, you can't have that password, and like, give me that phone, or like, whatever. You know, like, for three days, every single person who came to that tent, I was like, well, this is the person. Like, they're going to look at me, and they're not going to recognize me, and like, they're going to wonder what I'm doing here. And then it never happened. And it never happened, and it never happened, and it never happened. And I think that that is the sort of experience that is really valuable. Um, but I, I think that we all carry that guilt around. We all carry this sort of impossible standard of like what it means to be anti-capitalist. But actually, it's not about us as individuals. It's about the sort of what it is that we sort of belong to. You know what I mean? Like we use Apple products down to it all the time because when people donate it, you know, mm -hmm. um, what kind of assholes would we be to be like, no, sorry, we can't take that. Like that was made at the Foxconn plant where that dude was working six hours a day. You know, like mm -hmm. we need that stuff. Like, and if you think in terms of tactics and strategy and commitment, and less in terms of like ethics and morals and like consumption, I think that's the sort of shift that makes that easier. Yeah, I think I appreciate that. I guess that for me, it's less an issue of guilt and more a question of what am I contributing? Um, and I guess that would actually take, you know, active participation, of course, but... Um, Do you want my three questions for people who want to ask this? Are you an heroin addict? No. Are you dealing heroin? Not yet. Congratulations. <laughs> You're already part of the solution. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Well, did people actually answer the questions honestly? Like, yes. No, 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 no. no. This, 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 this is when people were always asking, like, what is it that I can be, how can I be helpful? And it's just like, really, just calm down and don't deal heroin, and then you're already, you're already part of the solution. Right, right. Thank you. Just, just go to it. I mean, really, that's about it. I mean, I buy Chef Boyardee and stuff, so it's really not about that. I would, I would just go and see what it's about. You'll find something you like as a way of things to do. And as far as buying an Apple product, or, or even um, getting one for free, as these people seem to be lucky enough to have managed, um, the, the question really is not so The question is, what does overcome, overcoming capitalism look like? It's not that no one in the world will have Apple products. You know. But perhaps Apple products is not a good enough example here, but really, we think about sort of, you know, I don't know, opportunities. Or it's not that no one should have opportunities or feel guilty about having opportunities. Mm. It is overcoming capitalism truly should be about delivering on the promise of liberalism, right? So it's actually about everyone having those things rather than me not having them, just like everyone else. So, okay. um, <laughs> sorry. No, that's it, it seemed to me that part of the question that you were asking had to do with how how is it that I can know who I am? With this? Mm -hmm. Was that that I could hear you? Um, is that right? I, okay, I'm gonna just like take it to a, a, an extreme, and I, I don't mean to co-opt yeah. the conversation. So uh, I guess like for me, this idea that everybody could own Apple products is in direct opposition to the idea of equality and labor because of how they're made. And this, I mean, I mean that might be a poor example, and, and I'm sorry if it is, but I mean. Well, if, if they were paid a living wage, iPods would cost $22 more. Uh -huh. It's like that simple. It's like really like, it's, it's the idea that if they were paid a living wage that we wouldn't be able to afford them is just not true. Okay, yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, thank you. Could I uh, take some, I want to appropriate what Rachel said and, and maybe abstract that. It seemed to me like, it seemed to me like you were asking like, how are my interests um, gonna align with the interest of, you know, defeating um, capitalism? And is that sort of what it was I, like? I guess, maybe, I'll let you go first. No, 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 but like, second. you know, like, if, um, for example, I have a job that I, uh, and, you know, I wouldn't be able to just, I mean, I could quit my job and like, be part of a tent and I could catch TV by like, sleeping in a tent, um, but, um, you know, I wouldn't be actually in my interest, even though I'm ideologically committed to be an anti-capitalist, to, you know, quit my job and, um, you know, hang out with people who are drunk and belligerent, apparently. So, like, you know, it's, it seems like a lot of people have the same um, problems. I mean, like, a lot of people might be committed to the idea of, like, overcoming capitalism, you know, whatever that means. I mean, it's very, um, uh, it's a mirror to, like, whatever you, um, make a deep subconsciously or, you know, whatever you accumulated from your experience, but how do people's interests, how are people's individual personal interests, if that's what the goal of um, an emancipated logic of, you know, um, aligned by being part of a protest movement? Like, I mean, could I, I imagine I could um, bypass some reification or these problems that left us tackle by trying to understand things rationally. Isn't why do I have to eat from a eat a, sit in a tent and talk about veganism with someone I don't like? <laughs> He's not speaking for me. I'm just. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say I think there was a slight fetishization of monks some at Occupy by saying if you if you're not living on site you're not part of the movement which is frankly not true because there. There was work to be done off-site. And the truth is, you know, some people have that privilege where they, and some, of course, were homeless and they did not have that privilege and they, they lived there. And, but some people maybe come from slightly more privileged backgrounds and they could actually stay there. But we, should, we shouldn't discount people who, they may have to provide for their families. They do want to get an education. They have jobs. And those are a real material matrix that people live in. And we shouldn't discount that. Because I, to give an, a, a very concrete example, I had family who could not come. They had jobs, they had priorities that they had to do, but they did contribute. They would give me food to come down. And I consider that I, a more contribution than the friend who would tell me, I support you, but I'm just not going to do anything to help you. But that was a real material contribution of someone who gives those five gallons of water. Or the family member who let me use their 
faster internet so I could upload videos for the projects I was working on on site was a real material contribution. And it's stuff like that. It's not, and yeah, if you can come down to help in the media tent or to help in the info tent or to teach a class, that's awesome. But not everyone can because not everyone lives nearby or they have jobs and families, as I said. But there are these real concrete ways you can help. If someone, if uh, for the Boston Occupier, if, if someone was willing, I was willing to bring occupiers out and say to family, would you just be willing to spread this around? That's a contribution. So we shouldn't discount. It's not just about being the, the activist there who's 24-7. There's these little small things to do that also help expand the broader periphery of social movement. Yeah, and I mean, the, one way the consensus model is problematic is because it takes a long time to do anything. And I mean, that's good because people get to air out their voices and stuff. But I know lots of people with children who work jobs, late shift and everything, would really like to come. And they're part of the 99%, sometimes even the bottom 10% of the 99%. And it makes it very difficult for them to participate. So the flip side of losing Dewey as, its place, uh, as a place to have discourse and talk to each other, I mean, which is very important, is that the dispersal of these movements across different neighborhoods allows these people to participate. And not participate in a kind of fetishistic way where you talk about veganism in a tent with someone you don't like, because that's just a joke. And anyone who does that is totally absurd. So I, I really think right now we have hope for people to participate in a, in a lot of different ways. I'll, I'll also say that um, talking about material concerns, um, you know, I went down there and, uh, and I understand that there is an effort to spread out Occupy uh, Boston from beyond where it was, but. There's real crime real estate. I mean, there was not room to, if I wanted to go and set up a tent, even my little pup tent, there wasn't room to do that. Like, I, I think that a lot more people would have come by if there was the, the, the space available. But it was, it was packed, um, given the little spot of land that they were allowed to set up on. Good comment to that. When I tried to camp out, it wasn't that. They were, they were made out of a ground for new tents, but there's always space to sleep somewhere. Mm -hmm. There's always the ability to go and, and write your name on a list, or at least in my experience. Mm -hmm. So there's a community tent too set up for like <coughs> two empty tents set up for a staff or anybody who has a need. Maybe I'll look around. Oh, there's another one. <laughs> Thanks so much for for I'll move because I can't see. Thanks so so much for talking about like your experiences. Um, m my question is like, I mean, from it's always it seems to be always tricky if you want to go like from a movement to an organization. What you guys have been talking about, um, and like what it, what seemed so great about the whole Occupy is it, it, is that it has that energy, um, that movement. Um, aspect and that actually has energized other like old movements like the labor movement and other organizations so i wonder like is it kind of do you feel like will it is it a dangerous step to go more uh in that direction like we need an organization we need a structure and therefore there's a trade-off that you will lose your movement part or like how do you think about it to be or is that the way to be sustainable like long term do you see a trade-off between these two or or how do, you, how do you see that? Um, I don't actually think there's a trade-off. I, I think people make this distinction without really maybe thinking about the consequences of it. So, I mean, what, what, what would an organization of Occupy Movement entail, right? I know there was some kind of proposal to meet in Philadelphia or something, like a national... It's National GA in December. I mean, there's all these different national things. Right. I mean, something like a national GA based on delegate model could form a national organization. Uh, really, the important thing to have in an organization is the ability to facilitate campaigns and, I mean, to have discipline between different occupies and promote a unified agenda. So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily conflict with consensus or delegation. And I don't necessarily think it's going to impose a top-down model on anyone. I think that depends on what kind of, how we make it or how we determine it to be. So I think it's very open-ended. An organization would be very useful, though, in promoting these kind of actions. And, and I think really getting these reforms that we need, because we do need reforms, I'm not against reforms. And I do think we need to win some along, but never stop. The whole point about not having demands or having campaigns is that we won't stop getting stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas some people just want to have one thing and then perhaps stop. Yeah. 
I mean, I think I, I, I you know, agree in spirit with everything you're saying, but I think that at the level of everyday life, there is a distinction, um, which is that you know we're all part of so many organizations already, um, and then sort of to take a movement and add it as a, as a sort of another series of things, you know what I mean? That like, well, this is sort of like what it was like before, right? Like I have all these meetings I have to go to, and whether it's platypus or whatever, you know, we're all sort of happy. We, we know what it's like to be part of an organization. Um, and I think that the experience, there's a, there's a risk of, of just the, the difference of experience between being part of something that feels radically other than another organization and, um, and being part of another organization. And I, I agree with you. you know, I, I mean, I think that organization is essential and necessary. I think it's, it's becoming more and more in place, certainly in Boston and elsewhere. Um, but I, I do think that um, we have to sort of, I don't know, I just think it's important to acknowledge that, that you know, showing up at camp and showing up at a meeting are two different things. Um, I have a question about the future of the movement. I'm just wondering, um, what is your idea of the momentum of the movement, I guess, in Boston and then as a whole throughout the country? And um, what is your sense of, you know, the flow of people into the movement, or the flow of people out of the movement, whether it's growing, um, how long it's going to continue to grow. I, I think to speak to this is, before the camp was evicted, I think everyone at camp, or at least a lot of the people I was talking to, were expecting a significant slowdown around this time of year, just because Boston is such a, a heavily student-based town, and a lot of students were coming in, and the truth is finals come, They're, a lot of them are going to go home, and winter was going to be a definite issue just because winters in this region are so can be so bad if, uh, if you were here last winter, it was horrible. You know, there was enough snow on the ground that you couldn't literally look around the corner. Logistically, you, as much as you may want to be involved, you couldn't, you, if it was like last winter, it would have been rather difficult. But I think in terms of the momentum, there's still, uh, I believe, uh, Occupy Boston has started a partnership with uh, City Life, so there's going to be probably anti-eviction stuff. But these problems are not going away. They're not going to go away in the next few months. And the truth is, uh, we're, I think we're going to see, and we're definitely going to see more in the spring and the summer, because this is an election year. It's going to pose the whole question of demands, of co-option, a new because the election's gonna be roaring around, and there are people within and without the movement who want us to become, say, the liberal version of the Tea Party, and would you know get out the vote for Obama, like MoveOn.org. But part of the good thing about the consensus process is um, that would probably be very hard to pass. But and all these budget cuts that are coming. So all of this is just it's just all mixed in there, and I think if the movement can sustain itself through the winter, through various campaigns, through making sure they're holding regular meetings, that when spring comes around and the snow melts, that we can really keep things going and we can keep these conversations and going. Because the one thing Occupy Boston did, it brought people who would pass each other in the street a few months ago, wouldn't know who, they, who each other was. And now because we had Dewey and we were all interacting with each other, we're all suddenly connected. And these connections should be sustained and pushed forward so we can engage in more campaigns that we can keep the momentum going. And I don't think we can say it's going to be a straight upward curve or a straight downward curve. We no doubt we see various zigzags, you see that being pushed back, being pushed forward. And the truth is, it's not that we're not going, we're going to just have a great upward curve and make no mistakes. We're going to make tons of mistakes. We're going to make lots of them. The important thing is that we're willing to take a step back every now and then, look at what we did wrong, and hopefully rectify that to move forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the practically, um, my concern is about it, it, that that question becoming the question. You know what I mean? Like, so we have a march about something, and it's like becomes a referendum on the rel of the vital signs of. It's like, oh, a thousand people movement, good. You know, and you're like, oh, 200 people movement, not doing so good. And like, this becomes the sort of concern rather than the issues that motivated it. So that's why I, I've been trying when I talk to people about it is to like 
break this idea this began in, in September 17th, but actually this is sort of an eruption of something that's been going on for a long time. A lot of people have been involved, a lot of people will go on being involved. Um, because as much as we are sort of savvy about the media, I, I do think we really underestimate the extent to which we take our cues from what they're talking about. And so insofar as the media is talking about it in a certain way, it is healthy and alive. And insofar as it is, it's dead and it's dying. Um, it is certainly the case the media will talk about it less. You know what I mean? And I sort of want everyone to like make peace with that <laughs> because it doesn't mean that it's dying. But like it will not be on the front page of the Globe for three days running. You know what I mean? It will not be on the cover of Time Magazine's first of the year. Like that, that will not happen, you know. Like, and so, as soon as people understand that, that doesn't mean the movement is over, the more we can have a serious conversation about like what is still, what is living, and what is dead and occupied. But I guarantee you, someone will declare it dead in the next two, ten days. Someone posted something on Gawker that made me feel like it was gonna, you know what I mean? But like, there are, there will be all these sort of media cycle things that, like, no matter how much we want to push back on it, will make us feel like it's over. And I just think that we have to sort of. Ongoing, non-going, I just think it's, it's going to continue because it has continued. You know? So one of the things that you guys have been talking about is sort of the how permeable the organizing structure is of this whole movement at large, which you know is to say Boston, Wall Street, Seattle, whatever, um, and the potentially democratic demands that people on the fringe would have and how they can sort of interact and what, you know, the movement has for those people. And I just wonder, I think this is actually along the lines of what I was kind of talking about. Um, I wonder if uh, Occupy is a civil rights movement, not the civil rights movement, but if you think, consider yourselves part of the civil rights movement or civil rights movement, and what, um, seeing as how everyone seemed to agree that it had anti-capitalist tinge, um, what is the relationship between civil rights and an anti-capitalist policy? It's funny, I don't think I'm part of a civil rights movement. I think I'm part of a new union, which is weird to say. So, if we, we think about a traditional union, right, at the factory, they operate at the level of negotiating exploitation. They negotiate the exploitation of labor power. So they say, you work seven hours this week and you make this much money and so on and so on. So they set the value of labor power for that particular factory. If we look at Occupy and what kind of contradictions that Occupy deals with. It deals with expropriation by banks or expropriation by dispossession. That's one form of exploitation by a rent. It deals with exploitation of knowledge because there are a significant number of service workers and people who are part-time contingent workers who make up the base of a large number of occupation movements. And it also deals with the problem of just absolute exclusion from I mean, undocumented immigration so on and so on. So, if you look at the port shutdown and the networking that happened there between the official labor movement and Occupy, also at the moving in, moving people back into foreclosed homes or fixing up homes, so on and so forth, it's really like the kind of same negotiation that happens in a traditional union. It's kind of like the same kind of advocacy and class power that is being displayed. So I really think that Occupy, I mean, I, I was kind of like a stretch, but I really think that Occupy is kind of like the new union form for the different ways that classes interact in like capitalism right now. So I think what it has to do with civil rights, it, I mean, it mostly has to do with, you know, reproduction of labor power for one instance, right? I mean, those things have literally gone out the window. Schools are gone, libraries are gone, all that stuff. All the state reproduction stuff is all gone. So one thing that people have been floating around is occupying the school. It's another way it fulfills that kind of union obligation. So, yeah. I mean, I would say that in America, the anti-capitalist movement has always been a movement for civil rights um, because so much of our sort of what would have been class-based energy arguably has been bound up in this question of race in this country. And I'll give you a really concrete example. When C.L.R. James was visiting Trotsky in Mexico in 1938, um, he asked him, you know, about this quote-unquote Negro question, right? Um, and Trotsky was like, well, they should join the party like everybody else. Um, and James said, no, you know, actually I think that they, I think that the struggle for black liberation in America should organize autonomously. This is actually one of the first sort of theoretical articulations of autonomy. Um, it's before Castoriadis and before all sort of, you know, it's, it's in 38. And so uh, the actual, and I think it becomes especially interesting when you think of that Hegel was looking at the Haitian Revolution when he writes Master Slave, but whatever, we'll come back to that sort of detour. But I think that in America, these two things are not so separate, um, especially um, in the question of the African-American experience, that oftentimes the 
you know, the march on Washington was a march on jobs, wasn't it? It was a march for jobs, not necessarily, I mean, it's sort of been retroactively interpreted as a full civil rights movement. I could be wrong about that. But there's certainly a tendency for the way we write our history to drain all these things of, anti of their anti capitalist you know, essence. And, and I don't think of them in terms of civil rights. And so you can make a sort of tactical point that one is more or less radical than the other. But I think the two are pretty much identical at the level of, of the actual history. So in that sense, I would say I'm part of a civil rights movement insofar as an American anti capitalist. I think, I, in a certain sense, yes, we absolutely are a civil rights movement. Because we have to really pick up where the civil rights movement left off, because it really it gave formal equality, one man, one vote, or one woman, one vote, and all of all of that. But if we look at the idea of the 99 percent, what does that mean? Because Evan has spoken to it. Who's the bottom 10 percent of the 99 percent? What about prisoners? What about immigration? What about women, race? You, you go down this list. And the truth is, if we are serious about the, being the 99%, being almost the universal class, as it were, we have, to, we have to address the concerns of the 99%. And that includes dealing with what issues are affecting the black community. What about police brutality? What about prisons? Uh, Noel Ignatiev, uh, as part of the Zen school that I organized, came to Boston and he said, well, he said that for the Occupy movement, People in, say, um, the black community, they like what they see, but they're kind of wondering, what, we want to take you seriously. We, want, we don't want to just look at you as a bunch of privileged white kids. I'm kind of simplifying it slightly. But he's kind of, he said, I think if you really want to be taken seriously, that you should call for the complete abolition of prisons. And this idea that it's a, it was a very interesting and provocative talk. I'll give everyone the links if you want it. But I think he was, um, he, he really hit on something, because if we're serious about being the 99%, then we really have to pick up on these threads of the civil rights movement that, in a sense, got channeled into mainstream politics, or kind of got, we have to pick up on that. And obviously, I, I'm going to be pushing, of course, for anti-capitalism, but anti-capitalism in some vulgar sense, is, is, it's not going to appeal to people. You have to appeal to the... The 99% means taking up the specific concerns that people are bringing to the movement, that they come out of the wider world that wasn't Dewey Square, and they're like, what do you guys think on prisons? What do you think on foreclosures? And that's a real concern, and that should be absolutely be taken up. So in that sense, we are maybe, maybe a slight quantitative, qualitative transformation of the civil rights movement. Maybe I'm pushing it a little too far, but... To be the 99% means you have to address the concerns of everyone in the 99%, and that includes people of color, immigrants, women, etc., etc. But doesn't the kind of politics that this then lead to, or the activities lead to, are just a, um, are just an attempt at re-applying, I suppose, sort of new left politics of you know, so we need more people of color, so let's occupy black neighborhoods. Let, we need more people who are sort of, you know, we need more women, so let's, like, basically it sort of becomes a series of uh, um, sort of uh, strategies which are essentially replicating the original idea, but trying to sort of paint, uh, paint them differently, or render them differently, rather, by saying, okay, if we, we, we kind of don't seem to have any black people here, so let's just, you know, let's go to a black neighborhood. We, we don't have women. Let's figure out a way to do that, rather than actually seeing it as so identifying it rather so as a question of strategy rather than a question of politics. I think to speak to that is there was it's not, it can't really be about us doing it for other people. It really has to be involving them at the base. And I think this really in, a lot of the, I think the left just didn't do their homework. They weren't out there talking. They weren't out there in these neighborhoods. Because I remember I went to an Occupy the Hood rally. I, it wasn't the first one in Boston, but it was the one a few days later on police brutality. And there were all these facts even I didn't realize about the level of police brutality. But the activists there, they could give me names, dates, websites, court cases. And I really think that it's not about us just suddenly adopting these demands or just going into a, a black neighborhood. It's really about 
working with the people who are already there, some of whom have been under the radar for years and decades, and we just haven't really made those connections. But with Occupy the Hood and Occupy the Barrio, they're, you know, they're there, and we should be working with them, not necessarily for them, but with them. I don't know if I'm quite making sense. But the idea that identity politics began with the new left is, is sort of, I'm just not sure that's true. I mean, as far as I can tell, I mean, there's a certain sense in which Marxism is the original identity politics. Um, uh, but I, you know, so it, is it repeating the gesture of the new left? Well, that's what the sort of, that's what the new left has become in retrospect. I'm not necessarily certain that that was the way it was organized at the time, and I think that's actually what gave rise to certainly um, feminism arguably came out of the failure of the new left to reckon with the history of oppression of women. Um, and so I think that it's it's not, I mean, I think the lines are a little, a little finer there, do you know what I mean? But the, the like, point really that I was trying to make is that sort of identifying this uh, and the sort of the line that I was trying to with the new left was really identifying the problem of, let's say, a group not being there in the movement, not being a part yet, as a question of strategy <coughs> rather than a question of you know, politics. So, so it sort of becomes like if only we did this, we can actually sort of, you know, I, th I think you have questions. Well, that makes sense, but I'm also interested uh, why civil rights does is, is automatically equated to um, identity politics. Um, is Do we not consider the right to, to collect the bargain or to organize, especially at the level of like, state employee, a form of civil rights? Or, um, what is a civil right? Is it a civil right to ask of your country to abolish the Fed or something? I'm just putting it really ridiculously, but to under to in, to enact certain reforms, um, financial reforms even. Um, does that make being part of uh, a a state even I mean, a better? Does it make it more equitable or just rather? Um, I don't know if that's making sense, but I, I, I am interested just in it, in it to bring out a kernel that it, that civil rights is, you know, of course the civil rights movement in the 60s was about race, um, very much so. Um, but it's interesting to me that we conceive of our civil rights in that sort of, as like a caricature of that moment now. Um, that we can't really think at this, at this point about what it means to be an individual in this liberal society, that we are actually critiquing as part of Occupy. Uh, before the, that answer is answered, I'm going to have to bow out. Uh, I apologize. Um, yeah, I think we should light up anyway. So, I mean, you know, if, uh, if there's some final comments that the speakers wish to make. Um, yeah, so I, I just want to touch it right quick. Um, so, what you said is a form of tokenism, grass tokenism, right? So I witnessed in some working groups that people say, oh, we don't have enough women, we don't have enough people of color, therefore we should stop working, and therefore you know, we should feel guilty about ourselves because we're just so miserable, and let's go colonize Roxbury or so whatever, like, let's go do this and that. But on the other hand, if you are 99% and you're sitting at a table with someone, with a group of people, and you're all white males, there's a problem anyway. So you're literally caught between like two awful situations, what's worse and worse, as someone would say. But so you're caught between either feeling white guilt, which is a form of racism in itself, or you're caught between the structural inequalities that exist in the United States, because the US is based off of white supremacy and slavery that exist, that the proletariat is definitely missing from the table. So there needs to be another strategic option to involve the lowest and deepest of the 99%. And I think that's what we're all trying to figure out how to do. Now, one way that people have been involved in, in Oakland, for example, the proletariat is involved in Oakland and they do have command of the GA, and they have been making spectacular actions. So you know, Oakland is already a history of anti-police uh, anti work, it's been a history of police brutality, there's been a lot of anti-racist movements there and so on, but also because Oakland has basically adopted the demands of the lowest 99%, and this is something that we need to bring forward. In California, Prisoners on Hunger Strike, I released a document that was like, uh, these are the demands that we would want Occupy to, Adopt. And they're basically national democratic demands. They look almost very similar to the Black Panther Party demands. And I would have no problem adopting these demands. This would involve everyone who is literally a proletarian, dispossessed person in the movement. So we need to look at it that way. 
So, I mean, at the same time, the answer is, yeah, it's like sort of destructive to see it that way, but also there's a lot of truth to it too. So you need to like find a logical way to really answer it and to deal with it in, in practice. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, so yeah, so thank you all so much for coming. the audio and hopefully the video as well of this. So you know just keep keep an eye out. I will probably use the same channels that you find it. Thanks.